Today is November the 27th, 2018. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and I'm working on a project called Oklahoma's Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, and it's a collaboration between the Oklahoma Conservation Historical Society and the Natural Resources Conservation Services and then Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And I'm in Oklahoma City today to speak with Stan Rice. So thank you for coming. You're welcome. Good uh, to be here. We're going to learn all about what you've done with okay. conservation in the, in the last however many years, 30, 40 years, I guess? It's been probably 45. 45, okay. Well, let's start with when and where you were born. I was born in Cowell County, southwestern Oklahoma, south of Hover, south and a little bit west of Hover, about 15, 16 miles. A community is called Kunkazazi. Kunkazazi was a government plotted uh, community. Uh, never formed up as a community, no houses were ever built, but they had a school there. And the school lasted until the year before I started the school, which I didn't get the chance to go there, but. Uh, uh, actually, I started Lone Wolf School, and it was really strange. Uh, it was right after the war. A lot of kids come along right after the war, so we started school with 47 wow. in the first grade. Couldn't have one class, so they split it into two. The class I was in was taught by a teacher that really didn't want to be a teacher, I don't think, anymore. Uh, so she was pretty rough on us. Cut my big chief nap tablets in two. I only got one half of a big chief every day to write my ABCs in big letters, little letters, and then my one, two, threes, and what have you. Well, I, at the end of that year, I told my granddad I didn't like that. So he told me at that time, well, if you didn't like it, I wouldn't go back. So I spent, a, I spent the whole summer totally happy that I didn't have to go back to school until mom grabbed me up in August. and changed my mind about it. But I grew up down there. I was only, I was like two miles from the nearest neighbor. And uh, I had two younger sisters. So that gave me free range. I did, mom, my youngest sister was probably a year old at that time. Uh, older sister was three. So mom didn't have time to look out for me. I just ran the world. I mean, I had the whole thing. I had the Red River on the south or the North Fork of the Red, Teepee Creek on the north. Uh, if it rained, no one got out of that country because half inch rain would just box you in. You couldn't get down the roads. So it was a, it was a very worthwhile time. Now, yeah, during that time, I'd say that family units were totally different than they are now, as you well know. Um, families would get together and, and help. they discuss, they talk. The talk at that time was still, I mean, talk of the war, but before that was a depression. So everybody was sort of like, I've heard the term depression oriented, and I think that's what we were. Mm -hmm. We were still very conscious of that, very aware of the hard times, very aware of, I would even say conservation to a point, because that's where our living came from. Our farm, we had the typical farm, we had cattle, pigs, chickens, you know, and, and, and we made a living by uh, scratching out a living and cropping, but we also did something a little unique during that time. We uh, milked by hand, no electricity, so we milked by hand, and the cream was separated but not refrigerated, so it turned rancid after a couple of days. But about twice a week, we would take the cream to Lone Wolf, put it on a train, and it went to Wichita, Kansas. And I didn't know for a long time why that was like that. I never thought about it really, until you know we 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 finally discovered that cream was not used for cream. It was used for stripping the glycerin out to make bombs. Wow. And uh, everybody did that. Everybody milked a few head of cattle because it was cash money, and well, that was what we lived on was the cash money naturally. So, long in the early fifties. Uh, even late 40s, uh, we got a hay baler. Dad bought a hay baler. And it was the first hay baler that you didn't have to hand block and tie. Uh, the old case balers you blocked and you tied by hand. And there was one of those in the community. Well, we got one with an engine on it. So we become the custom balers for the community. Well, at about seven years old, Dad bought a little red-bellied Ford tractor with a rake on it. 
and that was my tractor. So at seven years old, I did custom work. I would go out and rake the hay. Dad would be behind me baling the hay, and, and it worked really well. I mean, it, uh, I didn't know any different. I thought that's what kids are supposed to do. Today, I guess it would be considered child labor law. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, it didn't matter because <clears throat> that's what we did and that's what we made a living. It scratched out. But you know, the, what I do remember, a few things, and I've asked this question and no one seems to remember, but at the gin, which was two miles north of us, there was a sign on a, on a uh, swinging on a wire and it says SOS and had a little guy in the middle with the little semaphores flags and it was save our soil. That's what I thought. I about to decide it was save Oklahoma soil was what that meant. The 50s were as dry as the 30s. We had as much erosion in the wind erosion in the 50s we did the 30s. But we were a little more able to handle it. We had gone from the horses and mules in the fields to the tractors. It was a little faster to get over it. We could rough it up a little faster, but we still had the same farming techniques, basically. That was one way, is mow boards and, you know, turning under the stubble and doing those things. But I often wondered, I, I've never found out the movement behind that SOS. I think it was an Oklahoma movement, but I can't, even Google can't find out for me, so I, it may be lost. But I know I didn't dream that, and I know there was a movement back then. But we were so far removed from any governmental agencies, we didn't have a lot of contact with, uh, with conservation districts or, or anything. Maybe it was our own choice, I don't know. But I don't remember anything. My first remembrance of the, of the Soil Conservation Service was, was sometime later when uh, I think we had some ponds built, maybe some terraces ran. But one time I do remember it was a soil survey coming through. And I remember that little probe they had on that pickup, fascinating. You know, you really like to have one of those. <clears throat> you can do grand things. You can punch out a prairie dog hole, you know, and maybe something like that. I don't, I don't know what all you could do. But anyway, it was a good childhood. It was good. Everybody was in the same boat. I mean, you know, there was no um, overly rich people and there was no one starving to death, I don't think. But uh, anyway, we had, a, we had a good life. It, and um, I grew up there, and I mentioned to you earlier that uh, I, went to, I graduated from school in Jackson County at Warren. Mm -hmm. And kind of the reason I did is the schools were going out. They were smaller schools were being Consolidate. decommissioned. And, and so I wound up um, in Jackson County. Another kind of funny story. And I guess it, it stems from the fact that you're raised on a farm, you don't really think about things like you do if you're in a city. But when I went to the new school, there was about six or eight kids from our, our side of the river that went over there. And uh, the superintendent asked me if I would drive a bus. Well, the bus happened to be a 49 Ford car. So eight of us would get in this 49 Ford car. I drove the bus for a couple of months. and. Uh, one day he asked me, he says, did you, you have your driver's license? And I said, no. So off to town we went and I got driver's license because, I mean, you drove. I didn't, I didn't realize you had to have driver's license. I don't guess. I don't know. But anyway, I pulled through that little thing. Um, a lot of things I did in life, I just kind of skimmed by. School was not my favorite subject. I. Uh, uh, after that first grade thing, I, uh, I didn't really catch hold. I had the luck of the draw. I had a good second grade teacher taught me how to read. I had a good high school teacher that took me through, made me, made me want to learn. Uh, probably because he took an interest, mm -hmm. and and I felt good, you know. So I pulled through. But when I got out, I tried a little bit of college and, and didn't stick too well. So I kicked around uh, construction jobs and what have you. Draft got close, started Vietnam, so I joined the Air Force. And uh, it was quite an experience. I spent three years in France, over three years, and uh, on a, a 
that was our nuclear load crew on airplanes. You know, you load the weapons and go bomb somebody. We didn't know. Uh, <clears throat> I got out of there, went to work for um, Lear Sigler, which was a uh, aircraft, <clears throat> pardon me, aircraft missile operation. And uh, one day, my lead man asked me, he says, you know who you are, or talking to him, and he says, do you know who you, who you, who, 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 what, what I think you are, or something to that effect, and I said, no, and he says, you're a poor man's James Dean. So it kind of opened my eyes, and I thought, you know, do you really, am I that way? So I, I just, next school term, I will quit and went back to school. Took a leave of absence, by the way, and I'm still on leave of absence, I guess. But I went to college, started out as a chemistry major, geology major, uh, found out you had to have a PhD before you even get a job, so I didn't want to do that. So I changed over to agronomy, and I wound up, after a, quite a few schools, I wound up at Panhandle. That was still in my James Dean's days, so I, I could do that, <laughs> unmarried. I went to Panhandle, graduated there in 1970, and a week later went to work for the Soil Conservation Service. My job offers were from uh, the Border Patrol, not the Border Patrol, but APHIS, Animal Plant Health Science, whatever they're called, and in Laredo, Texas, and Ogales, Arizona, or I could stay in the Panhandle and go to work for the Soil Conservation mm -hmm. Service. So, so it was a job, that's all I knew about it. But you know, the first office I went into was at Beaver, Oklahoma. And uh, there was a, the DC there was John Riley. There was three people that were locally raised, Bill Searcy, J.D. Jett, and uh, Betty Lou Phelps. And that was sort of like homecoming. It was the first job I was ever on that I felt like family. And the, 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 those people being raised there knew the county so well and knew the history. Betty Lou was a, a great history buff, so she knew all the families. Uh, Bill was raised on the west side of the county, J.D. on the east side of the county, and between the three, I had the best of everything, you know. So <clears throat> my time there, one year, was spent um, going around the county, doing the fun things. I was a soil conservationist. I had no responsibility other, I think I had a, 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 a little pencil and maybe a, a scale for the, for the me to read the maps with, and the rest of the time I could do fun things. I had no responsibility. I wasn't assigned anything. So I did the grasses, I did the, help the guys with the terrace running. We built no ponds. Uh, you don't build ponds in the panhandle. Uh, we planted a lot of grass on the, on the marginal lands. They were involved in the Great Plains program, and that was kind of a unique program at that time. Uh, started in 19, uh, 53, 54, along in there, about the time that Soil Bank program came out. And it was a three to 10 year contract. And the difference was, under the ACP program, which was ran through the ASCS office, a person could come under the ACP and get one terrace line ran. Well, under the Great Plains program, all their land had to be treated, all of it. Mm. All the land they owned or controlled had to be within this contract. And it, if, if they wanted terraces, well and good. But if they had a piece of land that needed to go to grass, then they were obligated. If you wanted the terraces, you did the grass also. Or any other means out there. So it was, it was great planning. You get to go out and you looked at all the land. You talked to air the land over with the producers. And I found out something really early on. <clears throat> you need to make friends. You need to make friends. Because, and I, it, it kind of started to sink in at that time. But I left there and went back to Guyman. Guyman, Texas County, a lot of irrigation, a lot of different things. And the, and the, the uh, leader there, the, the district conservationist, was John Bailey. Uh, had another Bailey in the office, Roy, who had actually worked at the old regional office in Amarillo way back when. John Bailey had started in 1935 with the Soil Erosion Service. He knew all the things that had happened back in the real depression, the real dust bowl. 
Uh, the area I was growing up with, we blew, it, it was erosion, erosion and what have you, but we weren't in the Dust Bowl. Nothing like the Panhandle. Uh, Gail Brown was another individual raised there at, in Texas County that uh, I had the privilege of working with. <laughs> The thing I found in Texas County was something John Bailey told me. He said, when you go out here to work and do this kind of work, you're working for yourself. You're not working for an organization. They pay you to do it, but you're working for yourself. And he says, you're working for individuals that only see you. They don't see Washington. They don't see the state office. They only see you. So you represent not only yourself, but you are the organization. And he said, remember that. So I took that to heart. And, and, and here again, based on what I thought about Beaver, you're making friends and you're, you're doing your best. You're trying to be as sincere, non-technical that you can explain things that they can understand. And uh, not that I was a technical wizard or anything, but that was it. Uh, I had not started, I was pretty idealistic in college. In fact, the first Earth Day in May of 1970, I was a senior and I gave a speech on the commons at Panhandle, large crowd, 15, 20 people. <laughs> uh, nervous as all get out, but I got an A out of a class because of it too, so that, that, that helped me out. But the Earth Day, I didn't, I didn't understand. I mean, We'd always, we'd read Silent Spring. We had read the, the, the environmental issues. NEPA had just come out. I didn't know what it was at the time, the National Environmental Policy Act. I uh, found out a lot about it later, but at that time it was all brand new. We were doing a shift from probably, I'd say agriculture to environmental in a, in a sense, trying to blend the two. Mm -hmm. And it, it was working. It took a long time. It's like a lot of things, new issues, new ideas, don't always hit the ground right then. But you see them some years later, and you wonder, well, how did those, how did those things come to be? You know, how did they really get started? What, what did it take to get a critical mass out of it? You know, and 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 become commonplace. Had to do probably with um, a lot of things. Education was one education, uh, experience. The old way wasn't working too well. It just really wasn't working. Uh, we blend in the thing of farm surpluses. You know, the government always works with all the programs because the surpluses, they want to shut the, uh, you know, if we have too much of a surplus, we try to redirect things one way or the other. But conservation in this was purely so idealistic is that we knew the, the harmful effects of, cons uh, of erosion. Mm -hmm. So how do we treat it? We can't, we can't dictate treatment. We have to work through that. That's where conservation districts come in, locally organized, local people. So the districts allowed the Soil Conservation Service to be there in the first place and provided them a vehicle to go out there and and talk to the people and meet with the people. So the effectiveness, and it, it varied throughout the nation, I'm sure, of how, how they accepted this, this advice. And that's all it can be, because we're not regulatory. You can't go out there and force somebody to do something. It was a, a learning process for us, for me anyway, of how this all comes about. I had the good fortune while at, at Texas County in my first couple of years as soil conservationist to meet those people like Z.V. Gordon. Z.V. Gordon started out with the old CCC camps with the demonstration areas, told me how they did the terrace spacing, how they physically looked at a field and found out where to put the next terrace lines. Claire Stith was at Buffalo. He was one that had been working back in the 30s. Now, I think about today, 2018, and I think about what I was doing back in, in 1980, let's say. That's been a long time ago, hasn't it? 
But when I think about when I went to work in 1970, 71, 72, when I was working with these type of people, they were talking about things in the 30s. That was ancient. That was forever. It's not. It's like looking back now, only 20 years. And only 20 years ago it was in the 90s. I mean, if you're only 20 years old, you're a baby. Uh, and but I didn't I didn't realize those things. But you know the stories I got from that was like John Bailey. They didn't have any grass seed. They wanted to plant grass, but they didn't have any seed. They finally figured out that they could harvest sand love grass, which is a native love grass, and it was fairly easy to harvest. They had little six six foot Ellis Chamber combines, so they could go out there in some of the the better areas, flatter areas, and combine the seed. Well, it wasn't enough. So they paid high school kids or kids of all ages to strip, hand strip seed. They make them a little basket or a little bag and put a little ring in it, you know, like a steel wire ring, and they could strip. And they paid them to strip. Indian grass was the easiest one to strip. It's really easy. So they would pay them five pound or buy whatever the bag, whatever the, the quantity was to, to do this. Kids made money and they had seed. Then they planted this seed in some of these areas that were blown so bad that they couldn't even hardly get a tractor over, had no, had no drills. So finally, the Mr. Nesbitt down in San Angelo developed this drill, and it's still being used, by the way, that would seed grass. And we think about it today, and we thought, well, why don't you just get a four-wheel drive John Deere tractor and, and you know, air seeder and go out there and do it? Well, they had none of that. I mean, everything before that, Basically, we had wheat drills, but they weren't good at seeding grass. You couldn't get the grass seed through them. You had to have an a agitator in there to keep the grass seed down and, and force it through. But anyway, they got a lot of these areas, which are now like the Cimarron grasslands, Kiowa grasslands, some of those. A lot of those areas were seeded. Well, John Bailey was there when they were doing that. And I think back upon that, him telling me those stories, I'm like, phew, you know, I wish I'd have been there. Uh, not really, but, but you know, it was it was good stories. Uh, Z.B. Gordon talking about the running of those terrace lines, building those dams, how they had to do it. Horses, slips, mm -hmm. you know, Fresnos, and all the non-mechanized equipment they had to work with. Uh, amazing that they got anything done. There was a time, I think the the biggest time, and I think back on it. The biggest movement in conservation, and I wasn't involved, was when I was overseas. When I left, we had a little, I tell you, I had a little red-bellied Ford tractor with an A John Deere tractor, big tractor, 12, 13 horsepower, 15 maybe. Did a lot of work, but when I came back, we had the new generation of tractors. We had the John Deere 30. 10s, 3020s, 4020s, along in there. We had gone from one ways, which is just an old one way, basically, I mean, you farm it one way, you put it in the ground and take off. It's going to throw the dirt, you know. You had to farm each terrace interval separate because you couldn't cross a terrace with a one way. Mm -hmm. Well, you're throwing dirt about 80 inches when you run a one way. You have a center furrow, so you got a terrace space in here, a four foot interval of vertical height and 300 foot apart, let's say. Every year or twice a year, you're throwing dirt eight inches further down that hill. So finally you wind up with something that's got a steep backside, you hit a flat from that center furrow all the way to your terrace. So we had some really messed up fields, really messed up. So we went from the one way to a sweep plow, basically Graham Hamey's built in Amarillo, Texas. And they were sweet plows. The old A. John Deere's, we could pull, I think we had a 12 foot Hamey. You could put it through the ground real slow. 4020 would pull a 16 foot, four and a half, five mile an hour. The reason that happened, in my opinion, this is purely speculative, in 19, early 1960s, we took a lot of the young men off the farm. Family size had gone down. We took the young men off the farm into the army through the draft. Dad was left out there with no 
help. We had help in the 30s and the 40s because the families were larger. Not all the kids went off to war. But in the, in the early 60s, a lot of them, they lost all their help. So what did dad do? Rather than quit farming, he went town and bought him a better tractor and, and sweet plows, and that way he'd get over it faster and wouldn't have, he could still farm the same amount of land, maybe more. Farms did get smaller during that time. Families were moving off. And so, but there, it was a real change. Number one, when that sweet plow went through the soil, it did not destroy all the residue. I mean, it left the residue there. The drill still maintained about the same. We did the same thing. 16-foot drill, 16-foot equipment. Uh, you'd hang a drill right on the back of a sweet plow and, and drill it with a set of picker teeth on the back or something to get it ready. So, so we went from a, in my lifetime, in my early days, from horses to kind of small tractors to these really, really mechanized. Now we're larger sizing that now. I mean, we're going to 64 foot equipment and all that. But 16 foot equipment was was really, really neat. It's just a addition to that. It's not, it's not been a gigantic change from there over to what we're doing now, except for chemicals and some of the really no-till type, type things. But that was, the, that was a monster change. We saw labor, or the lack thereof, change things. We went from that old hand tie baler, or bundles even before that, a, 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 an old a bundle machine, a, I'm trying to think of the name of the silly things now, but anyway, from shock and feed to baling feed to now, they're round baling it. You don't even have to pick the thing up. It's, spits out the back of the baler and you run along with the tractor and fork it and put it on your trailer and take it somewhere. So that's all labor saving. But the, the real issue here is not the labor necessarily, but the, what we're, how we're treating the land. And, and as we go through this, this whole process, and I'm getting, I'm getting philosophical rather than going back to what I do, uh, what I did. But it, 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 it was a great change. I, during that time, a few years, I saw a great change in the Soil Conservation Service. Uh, there was a, about 1972, uh, I don't remember the name of it, I know I had to do it one time at a staff conference and, and talk about it, but we changed the way we worked. We, before we'd only worked with farmers. In about 1972, all of a sudden, we could work with towns, cities, units of government, rather than just strictly farmers. They still, they still need to be uh, cooperators with the conservation district, but we started helping towns. We started doing things with towns, drainage, erosion problems in towns also. So we started doing things with them. We opened it up to nonprofits, um, I, and I couldn't, I don't know of any great nonprofit project that I did or ever worked on, uh, but you could, church groups, summer camps, anything like that. That was, that was legal. Before that, we were told to keep our hands in our pockets. That was, that, that was the best way to describe it. You can go out there and you can talk to them, but you don't, you don't set an instrument up. You don't do anything technical other than talk to them. Mm. So, so that has changed. Now, when I was in the Panhandle, beaver ran terraces. And I mean, we didn't just run terraces, we ran terraces till you couldn't even. I mean, 500 miles a year not every year, but 500 miles. That's a lot of terrace lines to run. We, a lot of years, we ran 250. We had jobs where we'd put 25 acres, uh, 25 miles of terraces on one job. The land still washed. We still had erosion on that. We saw a change in 1985 when that, when the CRP program come along of grasses going back on those same places. Mm. Now that's where it really gets fun. 
when you can when you can do conservation and put grass out there because then you really see a change in, in conservation it's a, that's the kind of the ultimate I mean you're putting it back to where it should have been I know I mean we need we need food we need this we need that but um, uh, you know the ultimate conservation is put it back to what nature had it and then let's manage it. Let's let's get into a different system here. Uh, Selling that to the farmers had to be hard at that point, or not? Well, I don't know. It changed. It, it, society changed a lot. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of negatives to putting it back to grass. We took the fertilizer people. We took the seed people that were in town that was making a living doing that. We kind of hurt their business. Mm -hmm. We hurt the tractor business. We hurt, we hurt a lot of businesses in small towns. But environmentally, the, the pluses of that as a nation was so much better than, than, we were spending a lot of money out there. It was marginal. Now it's, it hasn't changed all that much, don't get me wrong. It, we, it's not a revolutionary thing. We didn't take all the land and put it to grass, all this. Right. There's still farming going on. But we started looking at the better lands to farm. We started looking at those places that didn't cost as much to put a crop in. Maybe the returns a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So maybe on balance, the economy didn't change. Now the economy didn't change that much because that, those farmers were paid in the CRP program to keep that land in grass for, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So they got basically and, and here again, you can get philosophical about it. If you read The Grapes of Wrath, that farm program in 1932 that came out, the AAA, the Old Agriculture Adjustment Act, declared unconstitutional two years later. But when it came out, those far, in The Grapes of Wrath, those people were not leaving that land because of a dust bowl. They weren't doing that. They were leaving that land because they were thrown off the land because they didn't own it. They were sharecroppers. And when the Agricultural Adjustment Act came along, they weren't, they weren't party in lot to it. They didn't get anything. So the landowners threw them off to collect their payment. The, the, the CRP that came along in 1985 specifically said that if you had a leasee out there, you didn't, he shared in that, in that so somebody learned a lesson during that time that said, you know, we don't want another mass migration. Yes, when the dust bowl come along and if things got worse, yes, people still moved. But that first, if you read The Grapes of Wrath, you'll read that into it. It's real, real plain if you watch it. They called it tractored out. You know, they were tractored out. They come in here and they plowed everything up, put it, put it to cotton or whatever they were trying to grow. But the land, the leasee, the, the sharecropper, okay. way he went. Mm -hmm. Families and all. Mattress on top of the car, headed for California. Part of my family went that way. My mother's folks all moved to California. They moved later, it was during the war, in the 40s, but uh, moved to California. And, uh, and they weren't tractored out. They still owned land and, at home, even after they moved out there. Uh, but it was, uh, it, the migration was, migrations never, are not, they're not pretty, you know, because you get the poorest of the poor moving. You don't have the, maybe the rich people moving Jackson Hole, I don't know, but anyway. Uh, I'm skipping around, I'm sorry, but um, how long I'm were thinking you, about those. How long were you in Guyman, Texas County? Actually, I was there only one not even quite a year. Uh, I went there as soil conservationist, worked in, from June until maybe April, May, and I was sent to Tologa as acting district conservationist. Uh, Tologa is another neat place, Dewey County. A tremendous amount of, of variety. Texas County, not a whole lot of variety. There's some, Beaver County, there's a little bit more variety. Uh, hills, you know, this, this, and everything else, but Dewey County was just, oh, uh, mind-blowing. Soils differences. 
uh, old river terraces, uh, good residual soils, alluvium along the rivers, and a lot of creeks flowing streams and on and on and on. So it was a uh, it was quite a thing. And, and then my good fortune there was uh, uh, the technician there was a guy named Logan Johnson. Uh, Logan Johnson was raised with my mother folks right down the road. So we had old home week when I found Logan. Uh, he had a very keen sense of, um, of uh, uh, character. I mean, he could understand. He, he would steer me one way or the other whenever we'd say, well, you know, you, you do this to this guy or, you know, he's the way he is and on and on and on. Uh, it was easy. And yet it was hard, it was only two of us there. I was used to offices at Beaver, we would have uh, crews, two crews running terrace lines and have four high school kids uh, temporary during the summer. So we'd run two crews. So we'd have a whole office full. Guyman, we had four and five, we had engineers, we had everything. To local, there was two of us. And uh, so the burden was put on me brand new. I never ran any, uh, any pond, I never staked a pond. I didn't know anything about a pond. I mean, I'd been out of the panhandle. I learned quickly. Well, I didn't learn real good, but I learned quickly that there's a lot of this I didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, good experience at Tologa. Spent two years there. Turned around, went back to Beaver as a district conservationist. And uh, went home, in a sense. But and still the workload was there, there were a lot of Great Plains contracts. Beaver had tremendous amount of Great Plains contracts. I mean, more than any other county in the state, way more. Uh, it, it was a good workload. Uh, I don't know if I could really key anything on that year. I only spent a year there. And then I went to Duncan as a, I think they, call, they had a name for it. They have kind of all these euphemistic names, you know. I don't, I don't know what they are. I don't know what I was then. Something like a resource conservationist meant that you're a jack of all trades. You got to get down there and get it. And the reason, one of the reasons, my boss uh, uh, at that time, Archie Welsh, brought me to Beaver or to Guy, uh, Duncan, was because I had come out of a Great Plains program county. The Great Plains had just expanded into the old Region 7, or Area 7, which was Duncan. It was all brand new. Archie really didn't know Great Plains. He told me, he said, I, so you, that's your stuff. You do this. So I had that. Then my exposure, and I shouldn't say my first exposure because we had 22 watershed sites, flood control sites in Dewey County, but they were all built. We had maintenance and what have you, and, and I knew what they looked like, I knew how they acted and what they're supposed to do. But when I got to Duncan, we were in the construction phase. A lot of, maybe four to five at any one time, large dams were being built. Uh, I had a role in it, not a big role. I didn't get to toot the horn or anything else. I just, I, I followed up, I did the vegetation. Uh, you go out there and you, you know, uh, you, you try to understand why, how, how this whole thing works. And it was a learning curve that I probably never caught. I never did know what everybody did, and I appreciate Archie Wells. He was like, you don't have to know. Those guys know. They know how to do their job. You know, you just keep them, keep water in front of them, and keep them paid, and 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 you know do whatever you need to do as, as co-workers, and they'll do their job, and they did. So we had all that going on. Uh, I worked, uh, a lot of things that went on during that time, during that, um, when I was the, uh, wherever it was, I told you I was, I probably call it different now. It, it, we did, we did things, uh, a lot of range work, a lot of, um, management and that helped because I was in the Panhandle we did a lot of, um, of um, uh, rangeland uh, it helped because I went to school out there because I knew the Panhandle 
better than I knew anywhere else. And it's still a learning curve when you move in. Even if you move 100 miles in range work, you're, you, things change quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, range management is you go out on places and you, you uh, uh, inventory and see what your grasses are. You, you know, get your loading capacities and, and all the other management factors that go in there. And, and you write plans based on that. And they're fun. Really, really fun. Nice. Out of that, we, Soil Conservation Service, wrote a contract one time with uh, a Fish and Wildlife to do a range plan for the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge. Uh, 59,000 acres there of, of federal lands that are, you know, held in reserve as a wildlife area. Uh, back in the old Teddy Roosevelt days, mm -hmm. where it all started, and, and they brought the buffalo and the longhorns and back to Congress, by the way. But <clears throat> they brought them in, and, and over the years, under a continuous grazing, the, the, the plant populations had changed a little bit. Uh, Smokey the Bear had stopped us from burning, that sort of thing. So we did a management plan for the, for the wildlife refuge, and part of that plan included burning. And now they're in a burning cycle, and people are not that crazy when they see smoke going up. They know that, and they put it in the paper and tell everybody they're going to be doing this. Uh, fire is one of those natural things, and it almost sounds political right now, and it shouldn't be. Uh, we need fire, but it's hard to do it because of land ownership because you have joining fence lines, no change in vegetation. You can't tell a fire to stop when you get to that fence. Yeah. And so people are, they're very, and, and rightfully so, they're afraid of it. And we don't have an absolute handle on controlling burns. And you always hear, well, we control the burn. Well, that meant that you were up on the hill watching it. You know, that's a controlled burn. The scribe burn is a little more serious than that. You really work at burning something, but it's natural and it's needed. And I see that in the future. I think we'll get better at what we do. Uh, after the, I actually it wasn't even after the refuge plan. It was before. We had a plan. It was called the MIP, the Model Implementation Plan or Program. I think it was. And it was, EPA was putting a big push for regulatory conservation. Now this is what I understand, Tanya. Don't, don't, you can quote me on this. Okay. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the people thought, I think politically if they thought, this whole thing is too slow. We need to really, we can do this. Always before it was a, it was a stick and a carrot. You know, we put things out in front of, we'll help you cost share on something, we'll help you do this, we'll help you do that, but you can take it or leave it. This was not a take it or leave it deal. It was gonna be one of those, we need really to force people to do conservation. The model implementation program, there's seven of them in the United States, and we got one. And I, by the luck of the draw, or unluck of the draw maybe, I was a coordinator. And there was a, the Little Washtaw, right to the south of Chickasha, 183,000 acres. Little Washtaw comes into the Washtaw River. Now the Washtaw River, I'll have to back up to 1945, 46 along in there. There was some gigantic flooding. Los Angeles flooded really bad. So Congress passed Public Law 46, and they created model watersheds. Little Colorado and Texas, Washtenaw River in Oklahoma and Texas, Los Angeles River, uh, and some more I don't know, about seven or eight of them, in which they went in with these watershed programs. If you look at all the concrete in Los Angeles along the rivers there, that was that program. That was a soil conservation service program. Literally built under that Flood Control Act of 1945-46 where it was public law. <clears throat> Oklahoma and Texas shared the Washtenaw River, starts heads out in the Pampa area, uh, Canadian Texas area, 
and comes down through Oklahoma, and it was a rip snorter. 1936 had a gigantic flood, killed 38 people, drowned. So, and you've had other interviews, I'm sure, with people who talked about the Sandstone Project and some of those. Well, this is on the midsection of the, of the Washita. The little Washita comes off. Number of people have been drowned on it because of flooding. Terrible erosion problems. So that was one of the model implementation programs in which we were to do voluntary conservation as opposed to regulatory conservation. That's why I got it in my head. Now others may disagree with that, but I felt like this is a, we're, they're under a microscope here. There's people saying, if you can't control this, then we're gonna do it. In controlling it, there was 50 watershed sites built, flood control sites, on 182,000 acres. There was probably upwards of 100 bridges removed and road fills put in, almost small watershed sites, mm -hmm. flood control, pipes down low where it didn't flood over the road, and there would be ponds, there'd be a little water there for the cattle and ducks and, and frogs and all that. Many, many acres went back to grass on that. Acres that were not, they weren't productive. They were, they were eroded, some of them were ditches. You couldn't even hardly walk over them, much less farm or cattle couldn't use them. So those, excuse me, they were, they were smoothed out and, and revegetated. A three-year program. While that was going on, based, and, and this was a USDA program because we had erosion service, uh, not erosion, uh, I'm trying to say this. I don't know if I get all my acronyms right or not, but the uh, the economic service from USDA, we had Ag Research Service, which was the uh, engineering modeling uh, organization, uh, Soil Conservation Service, um, all of USDA, Farmers Home, everybody. We've instrumented a lot of the watersheds in that. I'm I speaking of watersheds like a field. We'd put instruments at the end of a field for, for grassland erosion. We'd put instruments at the end of a terrace to find out how much water and erosion were getting off the terraces. We put, we'd put instruments everywhere. Had rain gauges that were three miles, every mile and a half actually. They were, were three mile distance but you'd have a rain gauge every mile and a half apart. Uh, instrumented the, the main stem of the rivers. Every bridge crossing had an instrument there that was collecting samples of, of the water as, uh, as the creek would come up or not come up or what have you. Uh, so it was a gigantic effort. A lot of money was spent in that and very successful. If you go, if you could look at Little Washita, snapshots, 30s, 40s, 50s, and see the, the out-of-bank flows, mm. the erosion that took place, and you go there now, you don't see that. I've, I've lived there now since 1978 in that area, across on 81 all the time south of Chickasha. I don't remember the last time that that river was out. It's not a river, it's a large creek, but it's, the last time it was really out of banks. It's just not happening now. And it's not happening because it's not raining, it's not happening because of all the work that's been done. And, and we see that in a lot of watersheds. We see flood control has been installed, big dams, uh, larger size dams. But that's not the only thing, not the only thing. When I was talking about my childhood in the 50s on the North Fork of the Red River, I remember the 50s were dry. They were as dry as they were back in the 30s, literally, from the, you know, weather service tell you that. Uh, if you read books like The Time It Never Rained, there, it, it didn't rain, except every once in a while, and when it did, that river would get out all over that country. And I remember as a kid going down there, you know, you'd, I mean, here again, mom had two little and she didn't care about me. So I'd go out in the water and try to catch frogs and all the other stuff. But grasses, 
and just proper management has changed a lot of that country. You don't see that river getting out like it does. You don't see the little watchdog getting out like it did. You don't even see the watchdog getting out like it did. It's, it, we've, we've calmed things down. We're not there yet. We're not there. But we see so much progress in 50 years. And maybe a little bit longer, I don't know. I'm not good at math, but it's, 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 it's been a short lifetime. But when you, when you go back and you think about that first day I went on the job and I looked at it, it was just, you know, and that's just me. You know, I, I, I know that, that other people could say, we'll never get this under control. And we did, we did. People in the 30s were really humped up again. They were against it. They were against it. They didn't have the technology to do it. Uh, they had the wants, but they didn't have the technology. So anyway, philosophical nonsense anymore. Uh, what did your dad think about all of this? What did your father think about all of this? You know, I think about those days and I think about the people that I was raised with. My father was probably a strong Scots-Irish. Didn't trust the government. Really, deep down, just leave me alone. But he did what was right. He did what was right. He farmed right. When, the, when, the, when, you know, and, and a lot of things we do out there in, in erosion control and, and farming methods is what your neighbor's doing. Mm -hmm. You watch your neighbor, you see something successful, and you'll, you'll do it. And you'll do it as the economic benefits come along. When you see something that you can less inputs on and raise the same crop or maybe even a little more, you're going to take an interest in it. I'm probably the first one in my family that ever worked for the government because I, I just sense they're Scots Irish and they're not they're not they'll they'll run off to fight a war, but they don't really appreciate leadership. They kind of want to do it on their own, they, you know. And it's the American Revolution. That's who fought the American Revolution. I mean, it wasn't the landed, uh, we'll get into that. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> those initiatives, I love initiatives. I think they're good. Here again, there are little bitty things that take a long time to work out. But once you get involved, we see the spinoffs from it. May not be exactly like you envisioned it. <clears throat> the Prairie Chicken Initiative. The, the, uh, in the early 70s, they came out with the Endangered Species Act and uh, always, always affected public lands, almost seemed like. The little brown bat, and they come out of the cave that, on federal lands. Uh, but it kind of hit the locals a little bit, the local landowner, because the bat might swoop down and get a drink of water out of a pond. So that was, you got to protect the bat. Uh, Black cap vireos started affecting landowners on the Edwards Plateau. Uh, you know, there, there's a problem here. As long as they were in the wildlife refuge, Everybody could feel sorry for them, but when they started nesting in your trees and you couldn't cut the tree down, mm -hmm. then it started affecting you. Prairie chickens come along, the lesser prairie chickens, and they were not on an endangered list, but they were potentially on the threatened list. It was purely landowners, purely landowners. That little prairie chicken didn't migrate. He was out there on your place and that's where he's going to be. So everybody got real defensive. What are we going to do here? So it worked over about a two or three year period, and it was a lot of conversations. We called them that. We called them conversations. Let's come together and let's talk about this. A lot of, a lot of hair pulling, literally. Sleepless nights, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. um, we didn't know if there was going to be gunfights. You didn't know. You know, and I'm not trying to be dramatic about it, but it's it's like we're talking to friends. We're asking them as a friend, come and listen. 
knowing full well you may not have an enemy when it's over with. But they listened, they talked, everybody was very open-minded about it. We're not, in, we're not endangered yet, we're not even threatened yet, but the petition is sitting in front of the Fish and Wildlife to put it on the threatened list. And they came up with some ideas. It worked to hold harmless. If you take care of your land because your chickens disappear, you're not going to, you're not going to be, a, it's not going to be a liability to you. We're going to do the best we can to take care of what we have, but there may be other issues. And a lot of these issues were, were man-made. Uh, questions came up. Uh, what about the hawks? Well, that's a non-issue because just because the hawks made a prairie chicken, we can't shoot the hawks. They're protected under something else. So you see all this mishmash of things that started coming together, and uh, a lot of work went on, a tremendous amount of work. They got the uh, the hold harmless agreements. They got the the working agreements, and uh, and there was there is some monies that went into that. I'll pay you if you will do this. You can't expect everyone. By the luck of the draw, you happen to own land that a prairie chicken's on. You can't, the American public cannot expect that person to just take care of the chicken because they want it taken care of. You, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Yeah, you like a chicken, but you're not going to spend a whole lot of money to take care of a chicken that somebody in New Jersey might think the world of. You know, so it's, it's kind of one of those things of, of if the public really wants something, they may be willing to help out on it. So that's, that's been a good project. It really has. Whether they salvage the prairie chickens or not, who knows? There could be some other factor come in, a disease. Uh, we thought we, you know, people think they have, but it's, 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 it's fun, it's fun. Wind turbines, wind turbines and the prairie chickens. Barbed wire fences, highline wires, uh, wind so turbines. Red cedars? Red cedars. When I first went to Dewey County, I remember a soil scientist coming in there one time, and that used to happen quite a bit. You'd be there and somebody would show up and you'd go look around. He said, well, what about your red cedar problem? I don't have one. So we picked out the areas, and it happened to be the Rush Spring Sandstone. We could find the red cedar. Look further, and we had red cedar out there about this high, out in the grasses. Why do we have red cedar now? We've always had grass, it's always been in grass, but it was overgrazed. Red cedars don't come up on over, overgrazed land. They come up in the fence rows where your grasses are higher. Or out there now, we're out there where we've been managing grass, we got it up higher, now we've got cedars coming up but not just for the thousands, but by the millions. So what do we do to take care of the cedars? Fire. Mm. There's no chemicals. Uh, you can spray them with ammonia and kill them, but who's gonna do that? So we got, you know, what the easiest way is to, you can't grub them out. After they get big, you have to, but they're small. You just sweep a little fire across there and take care of them. Still an ongoing issue. Mm really becomes an issue where you have urbanization, where you get houses out in all these really, really nice areas with the cedar trees. You don't hear any traffic. You don't even see your neighbors. You're protected by cedar trees. And you're very well protected until that little scooter catches on fire. Then he's like 55 gallon of gasoline out there going up almost. You know, and so it becomes a, a hazard. Uh, they're hazards to wildlife. They're hazards to, they're, they're, they're pretty good erosion control because the rain never hits the ground underneath some of the trees to even wash it away. It just collects up in there and holds it and has a leaf mat underneath it. It's really good. Still an ongoing problem. And I don't know the answer. Yeah, a lot of work on cedars. Uh, cedars are not just a problem in Oklahoma. You find cedars in Tennessee in the east uh, I, I, I've, I've seen them. I've seen them a lot of places, and I'm thinking, boy, one dry spell and one fire, 
you're going to be saying, oh, what are those things out there? You know, uh, a lot different than, than the fires, some of the fires we're seeing in California. These are really flammable. Some of that out there is flammable, but these are really flammable. But more scientifically than me can. Oh, and I want to imagine that they impact the water table. Of course. To some degree. Of course. The uh, Seco Creek project in Texas uh, was the one where uh, the streams didn't run. Old timers talked about the streams running. We don't have any streams running. They went in and took the cedar off. It wasn't a red cedar, but it was a blueberry. But they took the cedar off, took some of the mesquite out of there, and the streams started running. You know? Great project. Great example of things. And that, that's kind of like a lot of the things we do. Uh, you know, we had the, the old Cayabab thing back in the 50s with the mountain lions. You can't just take a species out of that and expect things to, you know, be great from now on. By the same token, uh, Seco Creek, you, you have a problem there, but you have a problem that that's, has been growing little by little for a number of years, and you have to go back and, and uh, and kind of reintroduce it back to its native state, and then things become normal. Keeping it in the native state is not that easy. It's really not. The uh, Great Plains were formed under a vast herds of buffalo. If we took it back and put vast herds of buffalo out there, it'd go back, but we can't do that now because now we have land ownership and different patterns and croplands and windmills and highways and on and on and on. So we're not going to wipe it out and go back to those days. But we have to manage somewhat in those same conditions. We have to go back to that. One is get those cedar trees off there. Get them off, however you can do it. Uh, I don't know the answer. Keep them all, I've got cedar trees on my property for windbreaks. I sure hate to take them off. I hope they don't pass a law since I've got to remove them. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few catch on fire too. Ooh. So how long were you at Duncan? I was at Duncan from 75 until I retired in, uh, I think I retired in 2000, the start of 2001, you know. So a long time. Then. Yeah, however, however many that is. I have to get my calculator out, 25 years. I'm thinking you only moved like five or six times for your work. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not up to big tech, not yet. Uh, it's um, well. Each of the previous moves, were you told to move, or were you given a choice? I was only one. Uh, I was actually the, the the system worked like that, like this back then. You spent one year, you moved, and you spent one year, and you moved, maybe. So it was kind of they didn't they didn't volunteer. I didn't have a cho I didn't have a choice when I left Guam and go to Logo. It was like, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're going because yeah. it's going to be a promotion. Then it was almost a volunteer to Beaver. I volunteered and I wanted to go. And then when Duncan came open, I wanted to go. Okay. So maybe the first two moves, it wasn't volunteer. But uh, after that, yes, I, I wanted to go. Uh, well, the uh, first couple of years were like on the job training. Oh yeah. In a sense. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Good experience. I had, uh, I was tagged for a job one time. That's a totally other story, but I'm going to tell it in such a way it makes me look good. Um, <laughs> I was tagged for a job, and I went in and talked to Roland Willis and. And I said, Roland, I don't feel like I've got enough experience. And he said, well, you know, he says, a lot of people get uh, five years experience, but they actually get one year experience five times. So there's a difference in five years experience and one year experience five times. You still spent the five years. And I've thought about that a lot. And that's true. That's very true in that you've got to build on the, on that, you got to keep, you got to keep your memories alive of what you did and why you did them, and and then as you as you go through, 
and I, I've been pretty lax on that. I spent the last 20 years in a program called Resource Conservation Development. Totally separate and apart. We did erosion control. We did, but we didn't do it with farmers. We did it with county commissioners, towns, schools, and, and such as that. Not terribly successful in all cases. Towns and schools have a great turnover. Uh, county commissioners do too, but not quite as much as schools. And in and and roadside erosion, which was terrible in a lot of places in Oklahoma, uh, we did a lot of work there. And, there, and we were successful and it's still there. We did a lot of economic development. Now, that's getting further apart from the Soil Conservation Service. We did a lot of, um, of programs at um, parks, uh, recreational areas. Um, in the name of, literally, it was, uh, I wouldn't say it's economic development, but a town, a town likes to have those to attract industries. Mm -hmm. You need a pretty town. So we would do the parks, we would do the recreational areas, we would do for other reasons too. I mean, you know, not just economic development. Uh, we worked with communities that were not as, uh, not as well off as other communities. And you're, try and you're trying to instill pride activity Maybe it wouldn't put any money in their pocket. Maybe they'd feel better if they were poor and feel better. I don't know, but but we did we did a lot of those really really fun work, fun good work, good work. Uh, find out a lot about people. Find out a lot about their pride. Uh, I found out a lot about men and women. The difference, not all the differences, but I found out. Please explain. Men, let me explain to you. <laughs> men will always, typically, a group of men will talk about jobs. Mm. Women will talk about making things better, prettier, clean it up, fix it up. Men will never talk about fixing it up and cleaning it up. They don't care about that. They just want more jobs and more economic development. But you, and you start sensing that, and you start seeing that when you're working with groups. You gotta blend the two. Mm -hmm. You gotta blend the two, because both of them are valuable. But, but one doesn't, well, maybe. I, I, I almost say that the women are more, more right on this, because once you get pride in your town and your community, then you have a better chance of attracting people feel better about themselves. I think you get uh, industries sense that. Uh, if you don't believe me, you go down and, and look at some of the activities that, in some of the towns and, and those that really are uh, trying to upgrade schools, parks, everything else, they have an advantage. They have an advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you say you do parks, what would that entail? Literally parks. Some of them were brand new. We uh, we took a watershed site and uh, go out there and build a park. Ooh. Build a park. Picnic tables, roads, trails, benches, boat ramps. Whatever it took. Ooh. Others we took uh, existing parks and and improved them. Put in swimming beaches. Put in gabions for erosion control. Put trees. Uh, here again, park benches, tables, um, such as that. And that would be a cost share type oh, program? Yeah. Oh yeah. With the town and the... Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I might say too, going way back, Great Plains program had a really unique feature to it. We used to average cost for identifiable items. Under the Great Plains program, you want to seed an acre of grass into a certain species of grass, you had an average cost to do that. Mm -hmm. Government contracting is really a strange phenomenon. You want a contract, you have your 
a stack of papers about four inches high. You sign off on all this stuff. You send it out for bid, and 120 days later, you get this. You don't like them. So it's on and on and on. So it takes a long time and a lot of paperwork to get a government contract. Average cost, we already know what the average cost is. You want to do it for average cost? Yeah. You're going to pay 20%, we're going to pay 80 or 75, 25, or whatever the factor was. And it's real simple. It's real simple and very fair. In fact, you were getting work done a lot cheaper under average cost than you were the, the contracts. Mm -hmm. Or two or three other federal contractual methods, performance of work, miscellaneous equipment. I can't even think of all the other ways you got to do it. And they were headaches. So under the Great Plains program, we had average cost. When we started getting over into some of these other programs, the RCND, the, the uh, Little Washita Erosion Control programs, uh, or Washita programs, we started using average cost rather than contracting, performance of work, and all these other government approved things. I didn't know for a long time we were the only state doing that. In fact, I was at a meeting one time and the guy from Texas says, explain to these guys how you do it. And I halfway did it, I'm sure, but, but it's, it's real simple. You can even do it with, as long as you have an identifiable unit that you have background on, you had to put in a number of them to get this so-called average cost. Mm -hmm. A picnic table is cost about this. I don't know, but you don't have a lot of them built. But under most erosion control, you do. You've done enough of them that you know that that one cubic yard of concrete going in there has an average cost of this much. Yeah. So you could you could replicate that and get this done. And we got a tremendous amount of work done in Oklahoma because of it. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of work under uh, a program, uh, the emergency. We had a lot of emergency work. Uh, it was a federal program and I don't know and I, I don't know the history on it or the background but it seemed like no one was doing this and we started in Oklahoma a guy named Don Vandersyp and it was the first one I knew that kind of started the ball rolling if you had a stream that the banks that, under high flow conditions were impacting a public very public, had to be a road, sewer line, water line, gas lines, something public. We're going to destroy it. We could go in under the emergency watershed program and attempt to protect this. And usually the way we attempt to protect it is putting rocks in that stream to keep the erosion, stop the erosion. We did numbers of them, numerous jobs that we did this. We pulled uh, uh, brush piles out of creeks, log jams, mm. and that kept the protect the bridges and the roads and, and lessen the flooding. Uh, ter terrible fun. I mean, that was more fun than anything I ever worked on. And it was go out there and, and do these emergency jobs because they were they were so fast. You didn't even have time to think hardly. You just say okay start getting the trucks in here and start calling people and what will you haul rock for and everything's on the phone almost and because it's emergency and uh, we got to fly a lot and little planes and look at damages and and uh, yeah it was just it was just fun there's you know a few things in your life you're uh, in your job you get to have fun with and that was one of them did you do anything with rubber tires on the on the creek banks? Yeah, where's Caldwell? I don't want him to hear this. <laughs> I was supposed to ask. <laughs> yeah, I looked at one the other day, and I see the I see the why we shouldn't do that. But we did some, thinking that they were the right things to do, and some of them were the right thing to do. Not in all cases. Now most of them hopefully are covered completely up with sand and vegetation. Uh, we, uh, we use vegetation a lot. Uh, being an agronomist, I always had a feeling that whatever we were doing out there was just supporting vegetation. 
If I put a structure in, I might build it out of dirt and build it way high and put a pipe in it, but I'm really just supporting vegetation. Vegetation will do the same thing, just give it a little more time. I can build that structure in 30 days. Vegetation may take 10 years, but it's gonna do the same thing. We don't have time for that sometimes. We need to go ahead and do the other things. So in that light, we put a lot of vegetation in some streams to control the erosion. We put locust trees, we put common reed, we put a lot of vegetation. I never planted any kudzu, but if I had some, I would have a few times if I thought it'd grow. Because kudzu, kudzu has got a bad name, but it was the greatest thing that ever happened to the Piedmont. It'll grow anywhere. It'll grow anywhere and it'll keep the erosion down. So that's, that's all I care about. You know, cattle grazing, you make hay out of it. Um, it's really a good plant. Uh, kind of like Johnson grass, it's, uh, no, I probably shouldn't get off on that, but vegetation is, is a key, is a key. Going back to the way nature intended it to be. Sometimes we've wrecked it to the point it's hard to go back. It's hard to restore it and get back into those things. Uh, like milkweed for the monarchs? I found out something on Mars. I want this to go down and I want this to be recorded. There's a little plant called a lantana. It's kind of a, not a very pretty plant. It's got a pretty little flower on it. And I was observing in this past year or so, when the monarchs are going south, they're the only species that actually gains weight in their migration. You wouldn't think so, because those little guys are just fighting all the way. Um, they love the lantana. That's on their way south. That's not the little summertime thing when they're just flitting around doing nothing other than laying eggs and, and getting on the... This is after the milkweed's already gone, but they will, they will work that lantana. And lantana is one of those things that anybody can raise. And I go back to my days in the 50s, the only plants that mom could ever have outside, we had no water to speak of, to water plants. So she'd grow hollyhocks. Just an old, ugly old hollyhock. Oh, that's that's, pretty. Well, but they would use that and use lantana because the lantana will grow. Cattle won't eat it. It'll grow out there around these old home sites. Those monarchs are using that lantana on their march south. So lantana is blooming all the way down into Mexico. Hmm. So we need to look at it and, okay. and use it. It's, it's a neat plant. It's a, uh, they even have annuals. They have annuals in the, in the horticultural places, uh, uh, nurseries. Uh, mine are perennial, but they die back. And, uh, and but they'll come back out. They'll, they're very aggressive, very, very uh, ugly plant to, to deal with because they got little, stickery hairs on them, uh, not thorns, but stickery hairs, and and uh, it's pretty plant. I mean, the flower is pretty. Plant itself is not all that great, but monarchs like them and I like them. Okay, I'll have to remember that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought some things of, um, I think it's pretty obvious some of the things of marriage between the conservation districts and the soil conservation and natural resource. I think it's pretty apparent that uh, and a lot of foresight went into that. That whole law, how we were going to do things, you know, and you had to have the local mm -hmm. conservation district set up. Goes back to what I said earlier, if you have local people, well thought of people, then you're going to have more of a, you're going to have more buy-in from the people. District conservationists or those people that's in the local offices, the most successful ones are the ones that the third graders know their name. The more successful ones. They have, they've established a, it takes, it takes time, but they've established rapport with, with the community. 
And once you get that, you get a lot more done. You gotta be a nice person. You can't be, I mean, you, and everybody's not the same. You know, personality-wise, you're not the same. There are times you gotta be a little bit um, rough. Not rough, but, but not, not bending, stern. You have to be, because some will try you on some things. There's certain things that you, 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 I mean, we have standard and specs on building things, and I've had people argue with me, this will work, this will work, I don't care if it'll work, I know it'll work, but it's not gonna work the way, if we're gonna put money in, it's gonna have to be built, you know. It's, uh, our old butt says, you know, play the game, you know, make the rules. That's a quote from Earl Butts. He didn't last long, by the way. But <laughs> as Secretary of Agriculture. But people in a community feel it's the best place in the world to live, or they wouldn't live there. And so you have to you have to become part of that community by making them feel like they're important. Well, how would you do that? What kind of, would you get into the schools to do programs you or do, I mean, how do you? You do whatever you need however to do. However you yes. can. Yes, very much so. I think school program. I think a lot of things, and I use the word third grade. I think a lot of things start with third graders. Seatbelts start with third graders. Anti-lettering started with third graders. Hmm. Third grader says, we shouldn't be doing this. Guess what? We'll stop doing it. Oh, we need to wear our seatbelts then we'll start wearing our seatbelts. Hmm. And by the same token, I think, I think our conservation needs to be education from, from, from the young. Uh, I, it may not work on the older, but the young are gonna take over one of these days and they need to understand. And uh, I think that's, but I, I really feel like our, our people should be a, a good part of the community. I'm not, I'm not ex Expounding change. I'm not saying we haven't done that in the past. I know we have. Right. I'm just saying it's very important that we that we uh, maintain a sense of community here. We are a part of the community. We live there, and uh, I uh, I'm not going to tell I'm not going to tell the budget keepers how you do your business. But I, I, I sense that, that sometimes we can get too far distanced. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes back to the old John Bailey thing, you know. You need to be friends. You need to be, you need to have a presence, and it can be a very structured presence, and that as long as they understand that, but as long as you're fair, as long as you have their interest in mind too, then you'll do it. I think another thing that we that was mentioned that we probably I should talk about was the future. Mm -hmm. And I I see a direction that, that that we're going right now, and and I really do like it. And that's soil health. Mm -hmm. I think that soil health, and it's really talking about sequestration of carbon, you know, on a bigger sense. And we made a run at this 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that we were, that uh, the greatest solar collector in the world is vegetation. It's not those, you know, and vegetation is kind of everywhere, pretty much. I had a plane ride the other day and I looked down and I see a gigantic solar collector field thing was probably a mile wide, maybe three miles long. Really? I have just flown 1,300 miles and you're down there at a three by one patch. I have flown across grass all this way. 1,300 miles by however many miles wide as you can see is all a solar collector. Mm -hmm. But that guy down there is making electricity. All this guy, is, all this stuff up here could be making electricity. You could harvest that grass and make electricity with it. Now you'd have to go through some more work. Yeah, maybe not more work, but some work. Take that grass, put it into a system where it was create heat by burning or 
by whatever whatever method you're going to use and then you develop your electricity off that if electricity is your goal it may not be maybe something else maybe we grow algae with it and and, uh, and eat the algae I don't know uh, could happen but I, I see the Great Plains and we're, we're seeing that now we're seeing a change within the Great Plains we're running out of water in a lot of places less water so it's gonna to have to cycle through I thought at one time it may be windmills I thought we'd have windmills all the way from Texas down I mean you know the, we've got a lot yeah we got a lot but I don't know if that's even the answer I think these things are going to break down they're going to be they're going to be big hunks of steel out there or aluminum wherever they're made from so maybe solar collectors are the answer cost a lot to build a solar collector gives you electricity the grass will too and we can play in the grass you can't play on a solar collector and they have a tremendous amount of money to put a solar collector from here to Canada or from South Texas, North Texas, whatever, you know, whatever this is, there'll be a lot of money to build all this. Why not let's just grow the grass and find out some way to take the grass and convert it to energy? And we're killing a lot of, oh, that's the wrong word. Uh, These red cedars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we drowned out the red cedars. <laughs> uh, yeah. Who knows what we could do. But I, I, I really feel like we got a bread basket. We got a lot of a lot of energy grown through crops. Mm -hmm. But I heard a story one time that if all you were looking for was the energy and the protein for the for America, population of America, you could do it in five counties in Mississippi. Now you'd be eating fish and rice, but you stay alive. You provide all the protein and all the carbohydrates that, that they need. Maybe a little bit of broccoli or weeds or something else thrown in there. People don't like that, they want variety. So therefore we're gonna farm a lot of different areas in different ways and there's reasons for that too. You know, I mean, look at, look at the advantages we have over a lot of countries, uh, even like Russia. Their wheat zone is a very narrow zone east-west. The crop comes off the same week. Ours is more, it's broader, you know. We lose a crop in North Dakota, we make it in Texas. We make a good crop. So it's not like, you know, a lot of other, we have the advantage, we have a lot of advantages here. But we're gonna lose some of our advantages as we lose our water Maybe we'll make up with it technology. Maybe we'll find a plant that will grow under drought conditions. It'll provide all the things we need. We still need food. And for purists like me that want to grow grass everywhere and know, know anything else, that won't work too well. We have to have food. We have to have variety. People demand it. So, let's, so maybe we fringe work on this, but we grow grass on a majority of it for fuel. Sequest some carbon. Is it kosher anymore to say global warming? <laughs> you know? Or climate change. <laughs> climate change. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I don't care. You cannot deny that the climate is not changing. You know, it's, it's upon us. Whether man made it change or not, I don't know. Yeah. But it's changing. It's getting warmer. I mean, look, the glaciers are melting. Maybe they did the same thing 10,000 years ago. And we cycle through that and come back on the other side. When, when there's only 750 men out there, you know, beating on rocks and, and making this climate change. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even get into that argument. Yeah. But I think that, I think that as we look at our farming on the Great Plains, we're gonna see a, a reduction in production. Mm -hmm because of, of water issues. Uh, there could even be production issues in California because of water. Demand for water being taken up by the cities rather than going back to crops. Uh, so it, as the population grows, we're gonna reach more and more of those little uh, pressure points of, of having to decide, do we want this or do we want that? And uh, and the homeowners will typically win because they're 
few more votes. Well, NRCS should be alive and well moving into the future, I would think, due to these similar issues. I think so. What are you doing on your place? Do you still farm, or do you no, have a farm? No, you don't farm? I've got a place that's uh, too small to farm and too big to mow. <laughs> uh, I have eight acres and uh, just enough to be a nuisance. Uh, no, I uh, I did a strange thing. I really, in, in my uh, uh, intelligence, um, I thought, it was going, I thought we was going to reach a breaking point back in the late 70s, early 80s, in that fuel costs were going to go so high. that So I planted this six acres or so to black locust for fuel. I was going to stay warm. I didn't care if I starved, I wanted to stay warm. <laughs> well, I've spent the last five years trying to get these stupid black locust stumps out of the ground where I could do something else. You know, I never did, I hadn't burned pickup load at all that. Uh, Natural gas never did go up. Electricity didn't go up that much, so so I didn't. I don't like the black as locust now. So I'm trying to do some different things. And I grow some um, grasses and fun things. Feed the deer and. I'm thinking birds. pecan trees. Well, you would have at least got nuts. Well, <laughs> strange that you might say that. I do have pecan trees, but I've never got any nuts off of them because the squirrels and the crows and the blue jays and everybody else, they all gang up. They're down there taking a number, I guess. When a pecan gets ripe, they all fog it. Uh, and it, dry, it got so dry in, the, in, in 11 and 12 along in there. Mm -hmm. my, I had six trees die, big, nice trees. This drought killed them. And they kind of sprouted back, but I mean, they, were, they were gone as a tree. They were all grafted up and everything. But, uh, well, I'm learning to appreciate the ecosystem that all this comes into play with. I mean, it's everything depends on the next thing. It does. In the system. It does. It's a, uh, uh, I, I, I still look at, the sequestration. And if it's important as we think it is, the importance then over on this other side of conservation is going to support that idea. Mm. And the two go hand in hand. Well, once you get those two in hand, then the ecosystem will start trying to take care of itself. It's hard to manipulate an ecosystem. You can only do certain things and hope it comes into play. It's like soil health. I think there's a balance, and once we reach a balance, we probably will recognize it. We probably will recognize when we have all the cylinders hitting. We will see, we'll see those droughts not affecting us as much as they have in the past. We'll definitely see the high rainfall events being taken care of. We know that. We won't have the erosion. We won't have the, the flooding. We won't have some of the other. And it kind of goes back to vegetation. Concrete can go so far, but concrete's got a limit. Yes. If we exceed that limit, it's like it's not there. Uh, but vegetation will always tend to. And then you add in the wildlife and the clean air and all the other good things that happen with a, with a, a strong, natural ecosystem. But it's kind of hard to eat it too. We do need a few acres of wheat and vegetables and corn. And the corn. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and then during your time, computers came into play. Oh yeah, oh yeah, fun and games, oh yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was told one time, that's not your job to run a computer, so I didn't and I'm paying for it now. But we had a time in 1985 when we went to the FSA, Food Security Act, and they linked conservation plans to subsidies. Now, I don't know how that worked because I was kind of on the outside looking in, but anyway, they linked it. <clears throat> and we got so strong in computers, they become more important than anything else. 
And it was kind of like I was watching all this from kind of a distance, and I'm thinking, boy, you know, that, that, this is just a means of getting something done. Just because it's generating a sheet of paper uh, doesn't tell me anything. I can see, I can see computers doing linear equations like if I'm trying to stock goats and hunt deer and have cattle and maybe some geese coming on my property and saying, okay, how do I balance all this out? A computer's great for that. But to sit here and just generate a sheet of paper, uh, I couldn't really see it. So I soured on computers. I'm thinking, they're just taking our time up. They're just, they're taking all our time. We're having more meetings over how to run a computer. We are on how to do a job. So. But now I see how computers, how they, how they help, how they, the storage really hadn't less than the paperwork, but it, the, 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 more information. All the data that you've collected. Yes. Like those, all those instruments you mentioned collecting That's that right. data. That's right. That's right. It's a good, sound way of storing things. I can find more information out now than I ever wanted to know. I mean, on a thumb drive, I can have a thumb drive in my pocket and have more information than, than... Well, do you think that's made less people to people contact? Like if you're keeping I your I hear community? that, I hear that, but it, it really shouldn't. It should even be easier because we now have texts, we have emails, we have things. You know, I, I don't know how you'd put the word out, but you probably could find everybody in the county that had a computer and link them in on a common email and just send out the blast, you know, from everyone right then. Just hit a button. Everyone have a prescribed burn tomorrow. Don't, there you don't, go. Don't panic. There you go. <laughs> well, we know newspapers are, are yeah, going down. Biting yeah. the dust in, in a sense. Uh, no one listens to the radio commonly, but if they were on, if your own computer popped up or your phone had a text coming in, you'd pay attention to that. And I, I didn't think I'd ever see it, but I don't see people without phones anymore, pretty much smartphones. Yeah. Well, I, and more and more farmers are using the mesonet for that, for the weather and all sorts oh, of things. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And the computer, I mean, the, even your tractors are Computer link these days, I understand. High tech. Very much so. And air conditioned. Yeah, and air conditioned. <laughs> I had a friend tell me that he said, I just read the paper. I'm out there plowing, I just read the paper. Push a button at the end of the row and it plows within two inches of the. It's hard to imagine that from the time you're seven year old doing it. Yeah. 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 I think, what year were you born? 40? 41. 41. You graduated from high school in 59. 59. And then went into the military and. I went in 62 and got out in 66. 66. And then you went to various colleges and then graduated yeah. in yeah. 70. Yeah. I'm trying to get my timeline. Yeah. All right. You know, and I, I hesitate to even mention, I started at Cameron. Actually, I tried to start at West Texas State and um, I, something happened. I don't remember now. Uh, that was my James Dean days. So I left there, I went to Cameron, I started back to Cameron. I went two years to Cameron. I went to OSU. Uh, I went out to Panhandle, went to work for the Conservation Service. They sent me to a, a joint class between Hayes State and, uh, and Kansas State. Um, two or three years later, I went to the University of Nebraska and had some courses up there. So I've been lucky on that. I've seen a great variety. I can wear about any kind of ball cap now, or a t-shirt or something. And, and uh, why, did, why didn't you stay at OSU? That was a strange thing. I wrote a paper in a seminar. I think it was over, I don't remember, water quality or something. I can't remember what it was now. Anyway, it was to be printed and I didn't know at the time, but I got an I in my course. I got an I. And I tried to call and everybody's on vacation. The grades came out and school was out and I couldn't find anybody. So I got this I. 
And I tried to find out, why have I got an eye? And uh, so it made me mad. Kind of silly of my part. So I just went out to Panhandle. I said, I'm not, if you don't give me an answer, I'm not gonna, so. What, it, was, you, what was your major there? Agronomy. I, still there? Uh huh. Yeah, I was still agronomy then, or I was agronomy. I only spent a year as a, as chemistry a major. Chemistry major, uh, which was good. I didn't. It's it's helpful. At least I got some better chemistry things mm -hmm. out of it. But what happened on that eye is they had submitted it to a, a magazine for publication and and never told me that and put me an eye and on my paper on my on my transcript. That stands for incomplete, though. You yeah. typically. I know it. I know it. I never did find that out. And I couldn't find the people. There was two, two instructors in that seminar and I could find I couldn't find either one of them. I mean back then, how do you find somebody? No. You know? Knock on their doors about or yeah. a telephone call. Yeah. 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 So I didn't know what was going on, so I just went out to Panhandle. And I needed I needed work. Um, went out there and went to work in the feed yard and and uh, So through the years have you had a favorite project? One you like doing the most? If I had to say a favorite, be the Prairie Chicken Initiative. Mm -hmm. And that has very little to, to do with soil erosion, but it has a lot to do with who we are. And, and I always liked range work. I like to work with grasslands. Mm -hmm. I loved uh, spring development developing springs. That didn't make a lot of sense to people. Why would you like a spring film? I'm something about, you know, a spring is like bringing something to life. If you know it's there, you know it has it has potential, but it's not really giving you anything, maybe a few little sedges, and you work on it and you get a pipe back in there and or some gravel in it, and all of a sudden you start making water. And it's like, whoa, now little birds can have a drink and I loved it. And I, I like to, as far as big time, I like to pray. I like to pray chicken initiative. I probably I like the the Wichita Mountains plan. That was a contract. Actually, they they paid the soil conservation to go in there and do the do a plan. And the product of that plan was for those people to take their own people, mostly biologists. And they would they would have to recognize and know five plants, and then they could do their own uh, uh, work out there. I mean, they could go out there and, and look at utilization. They only had to look at five plants per site. There would be a, a little change in those five plants all over the refuge, but they, if they knew the five, they could go out there and they could say, okay, this plant is being utilized this much and this plant this much and and do a rain survey of their on their own. Mm -hmm. We gave them the points and uh, what to, to inventory every year, what plants to look for, so they didn't have to have a whole lot of knowledge. It'd be fast and it, it seems to work. I don't know if they're still doing it or not. They did for a number of years. Did you have to do that by foot? On oh, foot? On foot? Yes. Not flyovers? No. You did everything by foot. We would set up a transect maybe two miles long and walk it. Walk as straight a line as you could, recording different plants. It was kind of a, it was kind of a, a rough estimate, but you got a pretty good idea of what you were seeing across that segment. Then it would set up a small transect of maybe 50 or 100 foot and you go down and you lay a tape and you literally identify everything that hit on a one inch mark. That was just mind boggling. So we just backed up from that and we did a step and when your left toe went down you identified the plant there. And it became just about as accurate. Then we did one, we'd go out there and we'd throw a ring. We'd throw it randomly and do the identification within the ring and you do it until you reach the level of confidence that everything, if you throw it a million more times, you're not gonna get any more accurate than what you already are. So we do those on those different sites. Uh, 
And that was fun. It was fun. Some of it was very monotonous. Some of it was very cold. Some of it was very hot. Some of it was very buffalo breath. You know, I mean, you had to keep your eye out to keep those guys from, they wanted to see what you're doing too. And uh, Snakes? Snakes, oh yeah, there's a few snakes. <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I think I was more afraid of buffalo than I was snakes. So what would the tools of your trade be? What would you have with you that day? A number two yellow pencil, a clipboard, and a sheet of paper. Hmm. Now, when you're doing transects, you'd have pins and, and flags and a tape. And you'd lay that tape out as straight, straight as possible, and you taped along that. And whenever that pin touched a plant at the one inch mark or one foot mark or whatever scale you were working at, that's what you identified. Well, would you have something with you to help you identify what it was if you didn't know? Yeah, yeah, you'd have to. You'd have to. You'd have to. And we had a lot of unknowns. There's, you, some, there's some guys out there that no one's ever seen before. We don't know what. Would you take pictures? We shot photographs of brows. We would take trees. There was trees, okay, back up, and, and we had photographs from the, from the early 60s. Of, of trees that were waist high and been browsed. We used to take a picture of the same tree in 1990 or whenever this went on, the same tree and he's no bigger. The elk and the deer and buffalo or whatever else keeps him trimmed back. So we had all these browse points and we would, we would set up a, a four by eight sheet of plywood that had marks on it and we would set it up behind the plant on pins that were permanently set and photograph it. And, and that way we could read how much browse growth it had. We had landscapes that were taken from a certain point and went back to the old four by five cameras and you'd have to take a photograph from that point of that landscape. Uh, I got a call not long ago, and they said, we need you to come over here and show us all those landscape points and all that other, and I'm thinking. And, and, and then they followed up with saying, you're the only one that knows where all these are, and I'm thinking, I don't know where they are. I'm just, I'd have to go out there and rewalk it and find it again. You can find landscapes where you have mountains. They don't move too much. <laughs> so you look, and you keep backing up and scooting over until you line up this little rock with that little rock over there about two miles, you know. And then you, you know where you're at and you photograph it. But you can't duplicate that because now we're shooting digital. And back then you shoot a four by five and you had a big format. And now you're shooting a different format, but you can get, you can get pretty close. Uh, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I did a project one time in Medicine Park. And Medicine Park had started out in 1912, I believe. I may be wrong on that, 1908, 1912. Uh, a guy, what is that old guy's name? Anyway, someone, the Lake Latonka, the water supply for the city of Lawton was being built, or was built. And down below the dam, there was this really neat creek area. So a little town sprang up. And this gentleman started having picnics out there. Bringing, and he owned the land. So he'd bring people out, they'd have a picnic, whatever, whatever you do in 1912. So a little, he started selling lots and people started building little houses out there and they built them out of these little cobblestones hmm. that are found native in that area. And so it grew into a cobblestone village. A lot of people went out there, bought summer places. My grandparents had a place out there. And it had the swimming pool down through it. Well, in the swimming pool, or at the swimming pool, they put a dam right below the big Latonka dam. And they put a generator on it. It flowed big concrete section across there and the water flowed through it and, and generated some electricity. Then it had a second dam. And in that second dam, they put a pool section in and put water slides and all kinds of grand, grand stuff. This 1920s maybe. 
Down below that, they put a third dam, I think there's only three, on the low end, and it backed water up to this one, it backed water up to that one, that backed water up to that one. Well, about, boy, I, I lose track on years. We had, a, we had a pretty good flood in there, and the lower dam was built as a concrete section and then had about a three foot another section poured on top. The floodwaters came and just peeled that off the top. So I was called in here, Oklahoma, and a gentleman said, we've got some money, they want that fixed down there, they want that water restored in that little lake, and uh, we've got some discretionary monies out of the legislature. I got a check here for $38,000, can you put that back in? I'll try. Well, we tried, we could not, we couldn't. We couldn't get that. I couldn't get any engineers to to do it. I mean, it had water flowing over it, and they couldn't tie it in strong enough, not for the money I had. So I said, I can't. I said, well, why don't you spend the money on just improving the other part? So that's what we did. We went in there and cleaned it up. We found things we didn't know that even even had. We found a picnic area, a little park area that no one knew about. We were digging around in there, cleaning the brush out, and we found it. But you go down there today, and people are swimming in the pool, and we got the pool cleaned out. It's a, it's just a dammed up creek, but it's all graveled rocks. They put trout in there, and they fished during the winter. Uh, some of the old things they did not restore, like the big water slide or the diving boards and all that, because they're afraid to kill people. It's very safe. But um, it's it's a fun place. So who maintains that now, would it be? Actually, um, it was privately owned. Privately. It was owned by the Texas Land Company, and that was a private f a family that owned that. And they got snaky about the liabilities of people going in there. So we, 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 we this is, I use the word we, I, I don't like to leave fingerprints, but we sat down and decided that we put a came in a island or some kind of a foreign trust, you know, corporation, and ghost this thing to get away from the liability on it. But they turned it over to the city, and the city took a lease on it, so the city holds liability, and uh, and the promotion and everything else. It wasn't it wasn't good for a family to do that. I mean. Uh, if you have any money and somebody stubs their toe, you're going to be broke. You know, so city. It was logical. So if the if the NRCS got involved with it, now would be something cost share program type deal to. Yeah, we didn't cost reason. share on it. It was just their money or yeah. state money that state money. that they wanted to do something. And it was very well spent. I mean, I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't say that it wasn't a good bang for the buck for that little bit of money. Uh, we didn't hook or crook things, we just did a lot of convict labor and, uh, and local labor and went in there and cleaned things up and, and uh, mortared a lot of things back together. A lot, of the, a lot of the old, all the walls in there are cobblestones and they put some really unneeded things in. They'd put a rock up here and on top, well over the years that rock got knocked off. We found the rock and we remortared it to complete the wall. and and clean all the steps. Steps were just, and then we had to do ADA on it. You can't, you can't have anything now without it. So we ran some ADA um, pathways. We had a swinging bridge, had to rebuild the swinging bridge. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people worked on it, a lot of people. And it was a good project. Uh, didn't quite fit the Soil Conservation Service thing, but it did, it, it was a, um, a um, uh, RCMD project, mm -hmm. so. So, the, what about least favorite? Least favorite, I would have to say, it had to do, and I can't think of that term, it was through Parks and Recreation why can't I? Uh, you know what? You just brought that up, and I hadn't even really 
thought about that and you're agonized over this thing. We had to do a full recreational survey in every county. Recreational. Count all the dams and the ponds and the this and the that and everything else and put it together and it came to Oklahoma as a needs. In other words, if you averaged Oklahoma, we got three acres of swimming for every kid in the, in the state. But Cimarron County has no acres. Hmm. But McCurtain County has 4,000 acres. But averaged out, it doesn't work that way. But we had to do it for every county. I hated that thing. We, we worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. It wasn't what, wasn't what they wanted. We'd have to go back and redo it. Well, recreation was defined broadly, or was it just fishing and swimming? I mean, would it be parks and golf courses? I mean, that sort of thing, too? Yeah. Wow. Did it do that one time for the whole state? And I think it's still being used. What is that thing called? Uh, I can't, what a, it's just been so long ago, I can't even think. Can't think now, It'll come but to I know you it, was, it was. We agonized over it because we didn't understand it. And about what time period was that? It was in the early '70s. Because I was at Tologa, I think, brand new, and uh, so it had been like '72, '73, along in there. <clears throat> Almost like doing a soil survey for the for a whole county. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, we had to have ever ever acre of water. And where did that go to the to DC? I mean to the No, no, it came down into Oklahoma City so and went in into uh So it was, it's something we have to, to refer to. It was a state thing. Yeah. It was like the the state historical uh mm -hmm. document. Uh, uh what is that thing called? Uh State Historical Review. Can't even think of that now. Well, the preservation office, I think, came into effect in '65, maybe, around in there. Mm -hmm. And they had to start doing some of that. So I don't know, maybe as part of that. There's an acronym they use. They use, and we had to, we had to go in. We have to address the historical review mm -hmm. on projects, and uh, uh, normally you're you're cognizant of, of really you know, distracting from something or, or destroying something that shouldn't be destroyed. Uh, we photographed a lot of things, trying to make sure we didn't cover it up or hurt it in some fashion. Uh, what was, I can, I can still hear Melvina say, where's your, yeah. I, I can't remember the name of it now. The same way with the recreation. We use that. Okay. That, that document. We'll Google it and find out. Yeah. I have I have Melvina's email address. I well, can get it. Melvina, tell you. Yeah, she'll. <laughs> you know, I was. Melvina and I were to meet the night of the bombing. Hmm. We were to meet in Binger looking at Highway 152 as a scenic byway. And. Uh, so we, we'd been talking, and uh, that was the night of the bombing that we were to meet. Scary. Yeah, she was in the building now. Yeah. And they were in a, were they in a staff conference? I know that Water Resources Board was in a staff, in a conference, or their monthly board meeting. It seemed like Marshall Gettings, you know, his coat was hanging on that rack and, and that window uh, I was a member of the credit union that went across the street in, in the Murrah building. Uh, and I was 16 out of that credit union. It was a sad, bad day. It was a bad day. She explained how she got out of the building, so it was, you know, it was yeah. uh, hard yeah. for her visually impaired as she is to get out. So, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, something else Larry told me to ask you okay. about. Okay. Dry fire hydrants. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was an RCMD initiative. We, uh, 
we look work a lot with rural fire departments, volunteer fire departments, and they have over the years always help. And one of the things that we that we bumped up against is uh, ISO ratings, and the ISO ratings are an uh, insurance rating that, that tells how effective, efficient uh, a fire department is. Uh, but insurance companies go with those ISO ratings to set your rate. So the lower the ISO rating, the greater the rate is to the landowners and the homeowners. One of the issues we always have in the rural fire departments is the issue of water, getting water, uh, having a supply of water. Cities have hydrants. We don't have any hydrants in the country. We have a lot of water out there. Sometimes it works that you can tap that water source. We have a lot of them that went out and they would try to tap a water source and suck up a bunch of trash and they'd get in their pumps and their nozzles and have all kinds of problems. So a guy, someone in Georgia or somewhere, I forget where it was, they, that we didn't think of it. Somebody else came up with this dry fire hydrant thing in which you set a pipe down a, and it goes way out in the, in the pond of water, a body of water, and you set it up off the floor of the pond where it won't pick up mud and trash, and it draws from that and it pumps up and goes into your, you have to hook your pumper up, and you suck it up and into your tank, wherever you're going with it. Well, certain fire departments really, were, were, it lent well for them. They could do it. Uh, and we were on the margin. My area was from Oklahoma City South, McLean County down Grady, Caddo down south. Some of the counties really worked well, and others didn't have enough sites, or uh, you didn't want to, or they already had a water supply, or various other reasons. We only put those in really, really solid in two or three fire departments. Uh, made a big difference. So we put them in a lot of other places, but they didn't. we didn't saturate it. T to get an ISO rating, they have to set up and they have to deliver so many gallons of water for a certain length of time. And dry hydrants then allow them to do that in some cases. They don't, ISO individuals or the uh, uh, people out there observing don't care where the water's coming from. They just want the water there. And uh, so anyway, we did some, we did some, and um, put in a lot of them. Actually, we made a film. We got the OSU group to uh, film a how-to put in dry fire hydrant. Uh, that was through the good graces of the Soil Conservation Service. Um, it's resource protection. And they would usually be put into watershed ponds? Or we did water, put reservoirs. some into watershed ponds, but the problem with the watershed pond is such a fluctuation of water, mm -hmm. height-wise on the on the pond size. We put one in below in the in the plunge basin below the dam. Uh, actually, Mobile Oil paid for it. Mobile Oil came to us and says, "Can you put one in there?" So yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll give you the money to go do it. So that we did that. Uh, we put one in a in the top side. The, the dam, it was a watershed site that, that didn't have a lot of fluctuation. So we put one in there. That was at Naples, east of Chickasha. Uh, we put them in all over. They were, they were more fun in the summertime to put them in than they were in the wintertime. Uh, in fact, I got to where I couldn't even hardly. We got some really cold days and some of them I, uh, Empire did a number of them, Ringland did a number of them, um, Bridge Creek, right here south of town. Uh, some didn't put any in, just said we don't need them. So. Well, were the watershed folks for it or against it? Never did ask them. <laughs> no, we did talk to them. In fact, I had a. Uh, Figured they'd have an opinion. I had a. I, I spoke. No, I didn't. I should take that back. I wrote it. I was to speak at a watershed conference in Kansas City, and it just happened to fall on a date my youngest son was graduating high school, and so I backed out. I wrote it, 
put Barry Bowles over at Muskogee delivered it, but that was to a watershed thing. So they were for it, or they wouldn't ask to be on the program. And it was in their program, so and that was a national watershed conference. It it wouldn't hurt anything. It just was your vertical height was such. I mean, you pull it. You have to pull a vacuum to get your water out, mm -hmm. and your vacuum becomes more vacuum necessary to get it at a greater height. So it was it was kind of a, as long as we keep it at about a five foot height, we could get it get it into the pumps really quick. Get past that, and there was no check valve on it. You couldn't backfill it and get your water up. So you had to pull pure vacuum on it, and it was it'd be kind of tough. Well, it seems like it would be an economic development type issue too, with and goodwill for the communities you're trying yeah, it to is. trying to it is. To build up that it relationship. Is. It is, and it, 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 it was a lot goodwill because we put no restriction on the use. They could go out there and test their pumps on it. If it's on a farmer's place, we told them, so you want to put a hose on it and irrigate your garden. You're not gonna hurt it. You're not gonna wear it out. Uh, you just have to put a modify the connection and put a two inch on it and start watering your garden. Water your cattle. Do whatever you want to with it. They were, yeah, dry fire hydrants, they were. <laughs> okay, and then the other thing we need to talk about is minority recruitment. Did, when you were at Duck, I guess that's the longest time span you were in, did it, more women and minorities yeah, come into play? I, I was actually, I was trained as a recruiter. I never went to a college and, and we never had any applications so I never did go from, from Cameron. I was a recruiter with Cameron uh, and we got people out of Cameron but for some reason I, I didn't get it. We got a number of um, uh, minorities. Uh, I can't, you know there's it's hit and miss on, on anyone you hire. And I can think of a number that we hired that were that were genuinely good employees. And there's no way of knowing of where they're from or who they are of how they're gonna work out. Some some like to work and some don't. Uh, so you can't you can't really uh, you can't decide by looking at someone of how they're gonna turn out and and everything. So I, 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 I was never very biased. Um, so when you were at Beaver and Gaiman, were there women in the office? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. not not, oh, not, 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 not secretarial, no, no, but, no, but, no, but no. like uh -huh. a soil conservationist or mm -hmm. whatever. No. no, that came along later. Uh, it was only after I got to Duncan that we had that, in fact, the first one was a bust. Uh, they interviewed her and asked the wrong questions, and she sued and wow. came on later. Uh, no, it, that was a, that came along later. That probably would have been in the seventies, eighties, eighties. That would have been late seventies, late seventies when that happened. It kind of set the tone on on what you ask in an interview. I know there's things you're not supposed to. Well, yeah, and it was kind of silly that, and I know who did the interview, and I won't, don't want to go on record as saying, but he didn't mean anything by it. Yeah. Just he didn't, really, just didn't. really didn't. Uh, they hired, I think there was 10 people hired, and they had slots for 11, and they didn't hire this one lady. And, and she found that out in fall suit. And it took about a year, but she came on, on the job. She only lasted about a year and she quit and went somewhere else, I know. But, uh, Fun times, huh? Yeah, sometimes. We had a number, we had a, a, a I wouldn't say, a, we never had a majority, but we had a number of our CND coordinators, women. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of our better coordinators nationwide were women. 
uh, I think they had that same thing I mentioned earlier. They had that they had a little more uh, feel for for community development than men did. Well, by that time they had been educated too. They've been part of you know, college programs correct. and stuff. That was slow to come about too. So it was slow to you know, come all about. that impacted the next step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, uh, it, it's worked well as far as I know. I, I, I've never, I never did work in a field office so with, with women. Uh, I don't know why it would, why, why it would be any different, really. Uh, yeah. It really wouldn't, I don't think. Uh, as long as someone's capable, and as long as they. They do the job well, you care less. And I, we used to we used to look at technical needs. Just because someone makes straight A's, mm -hmm. doesn't make them a good employee. Yep. It, it is that person that usually has an attitude that, that I'm willing to learn. Uh, a little more outgoing, a little more outgoing than. And not to say that that's, you're always going to find that perfect employee, but but if they're willing to learn, and uh, and and it has the initiative, yeah, it's good, it's good. Um, a lot of the a lot of the girls and I said girls, I shouldn't say that even uh, ladies that we've have worked with have really worked in some isolated areas. I mean. Not urban, not urban settings, and and I don't know how that would equate to anything. I don't know if that's even makes any sense or not, but they had to work with some pretty hardcore ranchers and and people out there. Uh, as you move into the cities, you get more cosmopolitan, and they're probably mm -hmm. more used to right. uh, that. But when you stick someone out there in Cimarron County, you know, but look at Cimarron County. I remember a day when when the three employees there were. Four, counting a district employee, women. The whole the whole office is women. I think. I know Sherry was a DC, and and uh, maybe it's three of them. But pretty much all of them. I never heard a squawk out of anybody. Only well, I mean, if they know their stuff. If they know it, well, people know that they what know. What difference it. does it make? Right. So there's been changes. Uh, it's it's been a it's been a lightning shot though it's not it doesn't it 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 didn't seem like it was going to happen and all of a sudden it it did uh, here again by the early seventies mid seventies no no I can't even think of one I can't even think well were there even any in your agronomy classes no. or are very many so the, no yeah none. None at Panhandle, none at OSU. So that no. had to change first. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. Uh, oh, there was. There was. Sally Trujillo was in my class out at Panhandle. Maybe that was in biology. We, we were so small, I don't remember <laughs> majors because we just all went to school together, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was a biology manner, so. I didn't matter in chemistry. So when you first, with your first job with soil conservation, did you think, oh, this is going to be my career? I'm not going to, to switch out? I never really thought about it. It just happened, huh? I had a good job in a feed yard. Mm -hmm. I actually would have been making more money in the feed yard than I would have been. So if you look at it from a money standpoint, it wasn't that. I kind of looked at it from, I need to, I kind of like to do this. Did you have an opinion when it switched from the, the chief being a career guy versus an appointed? I didn't know it happened. I really, I really didn't. That was never. We were never so political. Um, I, 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 I did know when it went from soil conservation to NRCS, and I talked to. Uh, uh, we were in Las Vegas. Nineteen ninety four. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I talked to him, I, and I thought that's that's a good move. It's a good move. The perception—you hate to lose your old ID. You really do. 
and I still use the term, I'm still SCS or but the perception, the public perception of natural resources is different than soil because we are more than soil. More than, yes. Uh, but no, on the political appointees, uh, I, I really didn't know it happened. I, I guess I, you just don't, you don't think about it to low level. It didn't impact your day to day. No, at no, all. not at all, not at all. We. Um, we had the old system of uh, the district conservationists in the office. You had an area conservationist covering eight, eight, eight counties, maybe ten. And then he went to the state office. So we had a filter. That area conservationist was our filter. We only answered him. You never answered anyone up there. Hmm. They didn't. They didn't come out. They couldn't override. They didn't override it. They, maybe they could have, but they didn't override that area conservationist. So we had that filter. Um, so you were an area. You met your your level. No. I worked in the area office, but, but you I were was, district. That that's a long story there. That I was area conservationist one day or something like that. I don't <laughs> okay. Remember. But anyway, <laughs> I was acting for some time. But we had that we had that filter, mm -hmm. and these we came out of a military system. The old CCC camps were military. We came out of that in 1936-7, long in there. A lot of the old CCC guys came over to Soil Conservation Service. Um, they were still there in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So John, it was John like, Bailey. yeah, I was a private, you know, they were, and they, they didn't say <laughs> it, but that's, you know, we could have very well been wearing uniforms like they did in the CCC camp days, and, and I would have been a private, and they would have been the majors and the colonels and generals and on and on and on. Uh, I don't know that that's uh, good or bad. I was used to that structure, so it didn't bother me one way or the other. And they become protectors of us. Mm -hmm. And if you if you dummied up out there, and we all dummied up in some way at different times, and and they were your, they kept those people up there. I'm pulling the wrong direction, but they kept them off of you. Mm -hmm. yeah, very seldom. So you got a lot of memories. Yeah. Yeah. We've covered a lot. Is there anything else you want to? I'd, I'd, boy, I've ran out. I'd, if you talk about it, I'd probably think about something else, but I'll let it go with that. Well, if we're not, I'll ask my question, you know, when history's written, what do you want it to say about you? I uh, left no fingerprints. Yep. I really never, really ever wanted my photo on the wall. I didn't care. Uh, that's, that didn't matter. Uh, I just wanted to think that, well, you know, he tried his best. Uh, maybe not as good as some, but at least he tried. And, uh, no, I, I don't want any, I don't want to leave any fingerprints. I don't want to say that's, uh, you know. Uh, other than to say that you helped make Oklahoma better. We hope. Yeah. We hope. We hope. I get. I got. A, I don't know if it's a compliment or not. One day, and I'll mention this: the little common reed, Phragmites, uh, is a genus, and you see it up and down the streams now. You don't see it so much. You'll find it on the Cimarron River. You'll find it uh, Canadian. If you go to Sugar Creek, you'll find it all over the place. And someone said, you know where, said, I was telling someone the other day, you know where all that come from? Said, that Stan Rice brought all that in here. <laughs> I'm like, well, I did. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad. It's kind of like who brought kudzu in to the southeast. We thought we were doing right at the time, and it's done a lot of good. But I'm sure those people trying to get to the creek don't like it because you got to wade through that jungle. But we planted it. We planted it everywhere. And the only time the state office even knew we were planting it one time, we requisitioned some. I think it was $615 worth. 
we borrowed off a guy in uh, Jackie Eubank, Breckenridge, Texas. The rest of the time we begged, borrowed, stole it, dug it ourselves. We planted it everywhere. And unless you're really looking at the streams, you never see it. But it's, it's a tall thing. It's got a real feathery head on it, kind of like pampas grass. You'll see it along the streams. Well, what we're trying to do is stop that stream bank erosion. Hold that stream bank in there. What, did it work? Yes. Maybe too aggressive at times. Well, prescribed burns would help with that too. Turn cattle in. <laughs> They'll eat it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or goats. Yeah, or goats. <laughs> I don't know if goats eat it or not. I don't know if they're tough enough. But we, we plant a lot of, plant a lot of trees. Uh, we had one job. We planted 114,000 trees on. Wow. And I don't know, truthfully, I don't know the state office ever knew that it happened. It was not an official. Well, what was the purpose for planting that many? There was, into the endangered species, there's a little guy named Red River Shiner. And we found a area down on the Red River that was there was an old lake, ancient lake, that broke through the sand hills. So when the erosion started, it just swept up through there and it was like uh, many miles of gullies fingered out from that, worked up through the old lake, back up a county road, one half mile up a county road, washed it all out. So the only way we could fix it was to plant trees, basically, and, and do some other work. but. Uh, we couldn't, didn't have any means of paying for it. So we submitted a proposal and it came through the Oklahoma Forestry Service to EPA to plant this, the trees for erosion control. And they came back, they approved the, they approved the initiative, approved the plan with some stipulations. We couldn't use uh, uh, commercial type equipment. They didn't want you going in there and doing some big time stuff. So we did it by hand. We told them, so we'll just do it by hand. Okay, so we pan planted that 140. We actually cheated a little bit and used a tree planter, but but um, that was okay with them. And the EPA funded it and uh, we planted that. Are they still standing? Oh yeah. Oh Looks yeah. pretty from the air, I bet. Yeah, you can see it. Various see. kinds of trees? Or well, actually, mostly black locusts. We did put a few um, uh, cypress and some red oak. cypress where we draw beaver in there, because they love cypress. We planted some trees for beaver to eat, so they'd come in there and help us out. If you can get a beaver to, to move into an area, it makes our job easier. No, but they do, they build dams at spillways. Well, I don't and know. And block the dam. The, care of theirs. The watershed folks will. <laughs> they don't like them, but I do. <laughs> we put that, we, the, the, what had happened on that lake, there was, the sediment was about 22 foot deep. Mm -hmm. It worked down through the sediment until it hit the bedrock and stayed, then stopped on the bedrock and, and the gullies went down. They, they come up in that old lake area and, fingers come out. Well, that bedrock had, that's where the moisture would go down and hit the bedrock and then come out. So we had moisture down there. So that's the reason we wanted the beaver in there to plug that up and, and flood the area. Uh, we'd had that once before. I'd seen it up on, up on um, it's called Horseshoe Canyon out east of Grace, west of Grace Swamp. And the beaver had really done a great job in that area. It just dammed up, just made a big swamp up in this canyon and still there, still works. Wow. So. And it was because of the red sh shiner, you said that? It was called the, it's called the Arkansas River Shiner. Well, what, is that a fish or? <clears throat> yeah, it's a fish. Now here's what happened. I, I left out part of that. The gully section, and it, it accumulated water down there. It ran down toward the river. And we walked down there looking at it one day, and as you go down the river, it's over this broad section of red beds, and it drops and everything. And these little shiners were up in there like mad. That's where they were, uh, they, they were spawning up in this, in these 
wide area because the red beds are basically flat. So this thing may be wide as this room, maybe 30, 40, 50 foot. And the water be coming through there, just just a skim of water. And have little poles and everything. And these little guys are all up in there doing whatever they're doing. So I convinced the EPA, I said, this is a this is a fisheries. Hmm. Arkansas River Shiner Fisheries. That's where these guys are. Oh yeah. And uh, so then we put the trees in to protect that fisheries. I don't know. I, I'm assuming it helped them. I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't my job to decide if this thing really worked or not. We go back to see if they were still there? I've gone down there. Uh, yeah, the trees are growing well. Or the fish, or the little, or the little I guys. didn't go all that far down there. I know they are. They'll take care of themselves. You don't need, <laughs> you don't need me to go down there. You've had your finger in lots of things. Yeah. Not fingerprints, but your finger in my fingers. I just stay on the background. I don't. Uh, we did a lot of tree planting, gully erosion tree planting. Oh, by hand, that took a while. It does. It does. We had a lot of prisoners. Okay, free labor. Free labor. Huh. Yep. We did a, we did a, a waterway at Davidson, Oklahoma, one time, and we used the prisoner gang that was the uh, photo op gang, the ones who put the stripes on and the guys riding a mule with a shotgun and they're riding in a wagon. Yeah, they they literally sprigged this waterway by hand. We put the sprigs in a trailer and they pulled them out and shoveled them in and like a half mile through there. They did it by hand. As long as I got it done, I didn't care who did it, and I didn't care how much publicity they got out of it. Right. So, we did a lot of wetland work, uh, restoring wetlands like Hackberry Flats. Um, that was one I was not very popular because I was accused of instigating that thing, and uh, maybe I was. I don't know. I didn't think so, but anyway, uh, we. Hackberry Flats, 8,500 acres in Tillman County. I think it's 8,500, Tillman County. And it went from private ownership into the wildlife department using Ducks Unlimited and wildlife department monies. And they restored it as a wetland. It was originally a wetland. It was drained like 1921. And so they restored it back as a wetland. It's a good sized wetland. Why wouldn't they like that? Well, there was a couple of reasons. One is farmers, if you, even though you pay someone, it may, maybe, maybe if you pay them more than they should get for a piece of property. We bought 8,500 acres. We stuck a lot of money in a lot of people's pockets. They went over here two miles and bought more land. Well, when that happens, you drive the price of land up. So all the neighbors were mad because you paid this guy money to go out there and buy land that he really wanted. Oh, okay. So you get, you get that sort of thing. Some just didn't want to sell out. They, they thought it was home and they didn't want to sell out. Well, they were kind of forced. They were kind of forced. I mean, I don't know what, what they could have done with them if they hadn't. But I guess back to order over them, I don't know. I, I wasn't in on the political part of it. I just, all we did was say, hey, guys, you think that might go land? Yeah, let's go with it. There have been a few bumps along the way. There have been a few bumps. Yeah. A few bumps, <laughs> yeah. But nothing major, major. Well, it didn't you, get. You would do it all again? Yeah, I probably would. I probably would. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a few stories I'm not going to tell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> usually my good stories are told on someone else, though. If someone else did it. I, I wasn't there, but it it was. There were some really good stories. But, well, it's taken a pretty good army to get all of this done. Oh, I mean, my goodness. However many yeah. years oh, from yeah. the 30s and so, so. You know, I don't, I think our area, eight counties, we used to have like 65, 75 people in that. 
not near that many today. But we had watershed offices, we had construction offices, we had extra offices. Uh, no. The bulk of the work was done during that time period? We'd like to think so. I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that. It was a strange, we had a strange phenomenon there for a while. Uh, <clears throat> we had a state conservationist. He actually became state conservationist here later. I think he was from Virginia at the time, Bobby Jack Jones. And Bobby Jack told me long before he came back to Oklahoma that Caddo County, right off down here, southwest here, Caddo County did more work than a lot of states. Mm -hmm. That was on the ground physical structures, dams, pipes, you know, this, this, and everything else than a lot of states. Now, not to say the other states weren't doing good and they were doing different type of work, but we were talking about structures, the need for going out and surveying and, and, and contracting and, and getting somebody to, to build it. Uh, is that the county where Sugar Creek is? I didn't work, I, I worked in Caddo County, but not, there's three field offices in Caddo County. There's three wow. offices there. That's, big. That's how much work they had. Hmm. Uh, it was in our area and I worked there. I wrote, uh, well, since I retired, I wrote a hazard mitigation plan there. In fact, I wrote two of them. But uh, that's been my work after I retired. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know if that's good work or not. That's my least favorite thing I've ever done in my life. Is writing right. those plans. Parts of it is a lot of fun. Public meetings is fun. I love public meetings. The only time I don't like public meetings is one time we had a flood. <clears throat> I was working in the refuge at the time. We got, a, we got a rain. It rained in the refuge. It didn't even rain down. It didn't even rain on Highway 62 down eight miles south of the refuge. But here comes all the water. So we got a town down there that gets a lot of water in it. And they're demanding to know the answer to this. So we go down there and I called on Vanderslop and my boss in Stillwater. And I said, Don, we're having a meet there. We're having a meeting with the city. And uh, so he comes down there. And we're in this room. It's in August. It's a uh, little bitty room, not much bigger than this. And there's about, oh, probably about 107 people in there. And we're up at this front desk, and Don leans over and he said, When you said meeting with the city, I thought you meant the city council, not the whole town. <laughs> I said, Don, it's not the whole town. It's only like, 10% of them or something. Well, they're mad. They want to know why did we flood? Why did we flood? You can't tell people why they flooded other than it rained up here and it water's come down. Yep. Well, we heard stories like, well, it didn't flood before they built Lake Texoma. Okay. You just got to go with it. Okay. And finally, it was, it was, it wasn't pretty. We didn't have anything to do with it. We were just trying to analyze why they flooded it. SCS, we have no, that's all Fort Sill between here and the refuge. We have nothing up there. Try to explain to them how the highway actually blocked some of your water. You know, they were wanting to tear the highway bridge out. They were wanting to do this and do that and everything else. And finally, Lloyd Benson was a representative from Frederick, Speaker of the House at the time, state legislator. He kind of diffused it. He said, people, you know, these guys are trying to help you here. They're not in here to argue with you or no, no. So it settled down. I thought, we're going to be lynched. We're going to be <laughs> lynched. We didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> but anyway, we got through that one too. Never a dull moment. Never a typical day either. It doesn't sound like Never. Never. That's part of the fun of it, I Never. guess. Challenging. I know it. I, yeah, it's just a lot of really fun. One time we were threatening to be sued, and uh, I, uh, I don't know, I called the State Highway Department and asked them if they had a, they said, well, we changed the elevation of a stream. 
we'd done something, I forget. Anyway, I called the State Highway Department and just so happened they had an elevation of the floor of a bridge so we could go off the floor of the bridge. And when they built that bridge, they'd taken cross sections. So when we went back and recross section, we hadn't changed anything. So I went back to Farmer and I said, here's, here's what's happened. Here's the way it was then and here's the way it is now. Well, what happened over there? And I said, I don't know what happened over there, but we didn't change anything. So I thought, boy, not that I would have stood anything personally, but when you get a lawsuit, you know, you, it's just not any fun. That's yeah, not fun. Nope. No. Well, thank goodness there weren't too many of those. <sighs> yeah, you More good not. done than not. That's right. right. That's right. Nobody got it shot or threatened or anything like that. Yeah. We had a, had a gentleman that lived southwest of Apache that I, he played left field, deep left field. Had a little bit of mental issues. And uh, he would just come undone every once in a while. And we'd have to go out and talk to him. We were kind of the moderators. He didn't dislike us, but he disliked everyone but us. Didn't get along with any of his neighbors. Didn't get along with the guy that graded his road. Didn't get along with county commissioners. Didn't get along with anyone, but we would kind of keep him settled down. So we'd have to go out there. Well, we get him. He gets into a squabble over something and the uh, guy grading the road, motor patrol operator, comes down through there and he stops him. He's got a gun. So he stops him, tells him he has nothing against him personally, but don't be grading that road because of something's gonna happen. So the guy quits and goes back and calls his boss. His boss calls my boss. My boss says, go out and talk to Earl. I don't know. Oh, now, what's happened? Well, he says he's, stopped a motor grader operator and said, didn't really threaten to shoot him, but he, he had a gun. Okay, what are we gonna do when I go out there? Well, I'll just go out there and talk to him. Why me? Why me? I guess I'm expendable. Go ahead. <laughs> so I take a young, young man who's now a state conservationist. But anyway, I take him. And he's not been out there before. I've been out there three or four times and I said, he pull up in this kind of a circle driveway. I said, here's what you do. You get up to where you can barely see that back porch and you leave this pickup running. I'm gonna get out. I'm gonna leave this door open, go around the corner of that house. And if he comes out of the gun, I'm gonna try to beat him to the corner of the house and you take off and I'm gonna jump in this pickup. So I had him scared. <laughs> and I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I go up there and knock on the door. Here he comes, just happy to see me as he could be. You know, nothing. No shooting, no running, jumping in the pickup. Uh, no having to get out of there. But boy, I tell you, I, I, it was scary. It's good to have a plan, though. It's good to have a plan, but after I explained my plan, he was like, I don't know about this. <laughs> Leave it running. We don't want this thing to be hard to start because we're going to be sitting ducks if he comes around the corner of that house. Uh, uh, we had a file on that guy. It had to be that thick. Every time you went out, you had to document it? Oh, yeah. You had to write letters and letters and letters because he would write. He would protest all the way to Washington mm -hmm. and when he come back down through. Then I had one one time in the town of Indiahoma. The guy, I, I'd never really talked to him. I'd seen him. And the guy was moving a house in and he wanted, he was, I was over there one day doing something and he said, well, how, I understand that water coming off that hill might cause me some problems. I said, well, just put a little wrinkle around your house. You know, you don't have to have anything big, just do it like this. As a courtesy over a hamburger, well, he did. Water gets up. Didn't bother this guy at all, but the guy across the road, in fact, it didn't even go over the road. It went come down the ditch and got this guy's house, or said it did, got under his house. So he's, uh, 
he's asking his neighbors, who was that over there the other day helping you? And he said it was me, he told him my name. Well, he found out who I was and called my boss. And, and after I talked to him, I went over and tried to talk to him. And he talked a while and then told me about how he was the CEO of a large company in Houston. And he just moved back out there to die. And uh, the radar men were out to get him and on and on and on and on. And on. So anyway, so my boss goes over to talk to him. He comes back, he's laughing. He said, you know, he said, you were sitting ducks. Said he had me convinced you had ruined him until right there to last when he gets telling me about that thing he's got implanted in his roof and they're going to bomb him one of these days. He said, yeah, it was the only thing that pulled you out of the water. <laughs> oh, it was, it was something though. Yeah, he said, he was out there one day and he said, don't look up the hill. I said, why? He said, they're watching us. I said, they are. That are watching us. Said that house up there. Said I'm not. I'm not gonna look up there. Things see us. Said that house up there. Said they. Uh, they got a telescope set up. And they're watching me. I guess if you don't strip off, you don't have too much to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, paranoid is. Wow. So you got those kind out there. Yeah. Yeah. And those were the days before cell phones where you couldn't have called for yeah, you quick could, help. Yeah, you could get your, yeah. Couldn't get help quick. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get you in touch with another guy, a DC we had, he's retired now. And he went out on a lady's place one day and she was carrying a sunflower, big old sunflower stalk. She said, you know why I got this? And he said, no. She said, well, the emperor, lives down there, he's got a ray gun, and says as long as you carry a sunflower stalk, it doesn't hurt you. If he shoots you, it don't hurt you. So, and he, he's talking to her about a plan, about a something, and uh, said she just went, <gasps> he said, I thought she's having a heart attack. And the emperor had shot the ray, and, but hit the sunflower stalk, but enough of it come off to really cause her heart to palpitate or something. That's what she tells him. I said, what'd you do? And he said, I got out of there as quick as I could. And said, I didn't want to be shot with a ray gun. <laughs> oh. well, you're doing some social work there. Yeah. 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 To... Oh, you get some of that. You get some of that. I didn't like DC work. I didn't like to work in the field for one, one simple reason. I didn't like dogs. I, mean, I like dogs. I don't like biting dogs. And most people out in the country had a biting dog. Hmm. Now these dogs didn't get to see anybody. So they just, they just wanted to bite on something. And when you pull up in the yard and they'd be rum, 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 I'm saying, get now. out. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I hated it. I hated to walk up that door if I thought they were home and knock on it. You know, you'd like to carry a gun, but a government employee shoots dog, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, take dog biscuits. <laughs> I don't know. These guys, they saw them so mean, they wouldn't even know what a dog biscuit was. <laughs> you'd eat a rabbit. <laughs> so those were tricks of the trade you had to learn, too, along the way? Is that what they do? No. Male I men? I don't know. <laughs> I say some do. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure they do. Yeah. Anything else? I think not. All right. Well, we thank you. It's been great.